feel 50 pounds better. I'd like to call to order the regular City Council meeting, January 8, 2020, 7:10 p.m. Madam Roll Call. Mayor Ronnie Felder. Here. Chairperson Kashamba Miller Anderson. Present. Chair Pro Tem Julia Botel. Here. Councilperson Trodrick McCoy. Here. Councilperson Shirley Lanier. Here. Councilperson Douglas Lawson. Here. City Manager Jonathan Evans. Present. City Clerk Claudine Anthony is present. City Attorney Don Nguyen. Here. You may proceed. We'll have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mayor Felder. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions, deletions, or substitutions? Um, Madam Chair, if the board would indulge staff, we would like to bring you an update on the MLK festivities uh, by Director Blankenship, and that would be the only item that staff would be requesting to be added to the agenda. For under presentation? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, the members would be okay if I deleted the community benefits on request, all three of them. Okay, all three. No, I'm just, no, that's all right. They're not, no, that's all right. All right, so we are going to add the MLK update under awards and presentation. And we are not going to take off Mr. McCoy's three community benefits. All right, any other additions, deletions, substitutions? Um, All right. Yes? I'm just... Uh, We're only doing additions, deletions, and substitution. Okay. Um, well, I guess my question is, what seems unusual, so I want to ask the question of... Okay, that's fine. I'll wait till we get to consent. All right, any other additions, deletions, substitutions? Disclosures by council? Um, adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk? Councilperson Lawson? Yes. Councilperson Lanier? Yes. Councilperson McCoy? Yes. Pro Tem Botel? Yes. Chair Miller Anderson? Yes. Unanimous vote. Members of the public shall be given a total of three minutes to speak on all items listed on the consent agenda. Any person who would like to speak on a consent agenda item, please fill out a public comment card located on the table directly outside of the council chambers and give it to the staff prior to the adoption of the agenda. Um, do we have any public comment cards for consent? Yes, Madam Chair, the acceptance of public comment cards for the consent agenda is now closed. All right. Do we vote on consent? We will in a minute. Okay. Um, Madam go Chair, ahead. Do you want to take a motion on the consent agenda first? So moved. Before we do it? I was going to do that in a minute. Oh. You so want, can I read this right quick? 
Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. All matters listed under this item are considered to be routine and action will be taken by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council person so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. All right. And do we have any um, council persons that would like to pull an item from the consent agenda? All right. Well, yes. Do we have a motion in a second? Are we going to pull one first? Please? Well, I, I'm just curious. So is this just a ministerial change related to the, uh, I guess, the triathlon date change? There's nothing significant about that, right, Mr. Evans, other than just the date being changed? I believe that's the only, the only change. Okay. And, and it's a requirement for us to notify the appropriate agencies. Um, so we need to do it by virtue of a resolution. That's it, thank you. All right, so do we have anyone that would like to pull an item? All right, um, we'll go ahead which, with the public comments. Thane Lozman, Latoya Perry. Thane Lozman. For the Good record, evening. the community benefits requests, when they initially came out, were always individual agenda items. Giving money, public money, to different groups is not a ministerial task. It's not like signing off on the written minutes or ordering, you know, something minor. So the public right to comment is quite clear that you were doing it properly before, but because you didn't like people criticizing you for three minutes on each item, you decided to hide it on the consent agenda. You talked to a lot of people about it. You're violating the Sunshine Law. Your city attorney should know better. You can individually, you can individually go back to the minutes when the community benefits first came out and saw they were listed as each individual items. So to bury something that's not ministerial in nature is violates Florida's, uh, they call it the anti-shush law and you removed me before when I try to talk about three items, and I just had my hands full with this remand of my federal uh, Supreme Court case. <coughs> it's going to be tried in April, so at some point in time I will challenge it, but I shouldn't have to. You should be able to go back and say, hey, why did we have it on the regular agenda? Why are we breaking the law <coughs> when it comes to Florida's right to comment law? Again, community benefits is not a ministerial task. Some people may not like community benefits going to religious organizations. Some might not like community benefits going to high schools outside of Riviera Beach, which they have. But they have a right to comment on those items per Florida law. And your city attorney just is afraid to speak up and explain to you guys what the law is. But ignorance of the law is not an excuse. You have the requirement to know what the law should be. And your chairperson should remember, because when she first came in, community benefits were separate items. I've already done the research and I have the minutes where they were separate items and then they were moved into the consent agenda. And you know, there's lots of things I'll make in my public comments, but I, I keep coming back to this and at some point in time I'm gonna ask the court to enforce uh, the public's right to speak law and explain to you what a ministerial item is and spending money on these three different charities is not ministerial. Thank you. Latoya Perry. Good evening, council president. Good evening. City attorney, city manager, and everyone in this room. I just want to come before you today and say thank you. Um, I am one of the small charities here in the community that is able to do things for our community. This year, we just finished the year out, with, last year out, with our comedy Laugh Out Loud benefit, and we were able to honor two families, a family of 12, I was burnt out and suffered from domestic violence. We were able to provide them with sheets, blankets, household items, and toys for the children. And because of your help from the community benefits, we do appreciate you and thank you. Thank you. Madam that, Chair, that completes public comments on the consent agenda. All right, can we have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Have second. a second. All right, Madam Clerk. 
Councilperson Lawson. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Councilperson McCoy. Yes. Pro Tem Votel. Yes. Chair Miller Anderson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Any person who would like to speak on an agenda item, please fill out a public comment card located on the table directly outside of the council chambers and give it to the staff prior to the item being presented to city council for discussion. Members of the public will be given three minutes to speak on each regular agenda item. In no event will anyone be allowed to submit a comment card and speak on an agenda item after the resolution is read or item considered. Um, awards and presentations. Presentation on MLK activities. All right, Mr. Manager. Madam Chair and members of the council, if I can have Parks and Recreation Director, Mr. Richard Blankensip, uh, share a brief presentation on the festivities associated with the Martin Luther King uh, festivities in our community. Good evening, Good Mayor, evening. Council, City Manager, Richard Blankenship, Parks and Recreation Director. I'm uh, just gonna take a few minutes to go over the uh, plan for um, uh, the MLK festivities, which begin a week from tomorrow. Uh, the first program will be the Senior Luncheon, which will be at the Event Center. Uh, our uh, theme is Building a Bridge to Harmony. Our guest speaker is um, Cassandra Fullwood. And as of this afternoon, we have a capacity of 250. We're at about 200. The notices went out Monday, so we started issuing tickets on Monday. So it's a very popular activity, very popular event. Um, that is next Thursday, the 16th. On Saturday, the 18th, we do the very popular MLK parade. Um, you will be getting your directions, directives, and notices about where to be and when to be for a parade lineup uh, very shortly. Um, Ms. Franks has uh, produced a very uh, active parade again this year, or is, is in the process of producing one with a, a lot of talent, a lot of uh, unique uh, folks that will uh, make it a, a grand day. What I don't have a slide for is the film series that the library is sponsoring. This starts January, it'll go January 21st, 22nd, and 23rd at the event center. Once we have finalized on what films they're going to highlight, uh, we will begin to market that. Then the soiree, we're not doing a gala this year. Uh, the committee felt like the, uh, the uh, financial liability of doing a gala uh, was, was quite a bit, so we decided to do a, a maybe a, a, a different approach to a celebration. Um, this is on January 24th from 7 to 11 p.m. at the event center. We will be sending each of you additional information, uh, but it is basically it, it's a, an opportunity for uh, folks to dress up and come out and have, uh, there's no sit-down dinner, there's hors d'oeuvres and dancing and live music and a DJ and just an uh, opportunity to fellowship. And then uh, the last thing that I want to show you is the artwork for the MLK t-shirts. These are on sale now at Barracuda Bay for $10 a piece. We have them in white and we also have them in black. And they're very, uh, uh, getting a lot of good comments about the design and the, and the, the colors and, the, and that, that's obviously the Blue Heron Bridge and um, trying to highlight our theme of building a bridge to harmony. With that, I'll answer any questions you may have. All right, do we have any questions or comments from the council? All right, thank you thank so you. much, Mr. Blankenship. Look forward to these activities. All right, ordinance on second and final reading item number nine. Ordinance number 4142. In ordinance of the City Council of the City of Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, abandoning a portion of Old East 13th Street, Flagner, Flagner, Flagger. Is that Flag, Flagler? that's wrong. Is that right? Flagger? Is it Flagger or Flagler? It's Flagler. Flagger is what it says. But is that right? Uh, Flagler is the name of the street. Flagler is the name of the. Name it's missing an L. Flagler okay. Avenue per Platt as shown on Riviera according to the plat thereof as recorded in plat book two, page 90 and 91 of the public records of Palm Beach County, Florida, said portion lying in between block two and block 14 of said plat, bounded on the east by the west right, right of way line of Avenue C and bounded on the west by the east right of way line of Broadway 
US 1 State Road number 5 and said lands lying and being in section 33, Township 42, South, Range 43 East, located within the city of Riviera Beach, Florida, containing 25,508 <coughs> square feet, more or less, providing conditions, providing for severability and conflicts, and providing for an effective date. Madam Chair, we have public comment cards on this item. The acceptance of public comment cards on this item is now closed. All right, we'll have a motion. So moved. Second. All right, Mr. Manager. Madam Chair and members of the council, uh, if I can have Acting Development Services Director, Mr. Jeff Gagnon, present this item. Also co-presenting with Mr. Gagnon will be the Executive Director, Mr. Scott Evans from the CRA. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Honorable Good evening. Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, Jeff Gagnon, Acting Director of Development Services for the City. Uh, so you have before you the second reading of uh, the ordinance uh, for your consideration. This is abandonment of a portion of Old East 13th Street. Uh, the area in question is shown before you, highlighted in the red box. Uh, and as we zoom in a little closer, uh, the same area uh, to be abandoned is highlighted. Uh, I also want to point out that the main ingress and egress point into the Marina District Uplands uh, is through the uh, improved West 13th Street area to the north of Old East 13th Street. Um, this is the primary ingress and egress point. This is the area that most people recognize as the gateway into the Marina Uplands. Uh, I also want to point out that there is a traffic circulation pattern that would exist uh, also south of Old East 13th Street being that East 12th Street uh, allows for both ingress and egress um, to that area. Uh, for the record, this is a copy of the survey provided. Uh, again, the abandonment area is called out here. Additionally, these are the engineering plans which uh, demonstrate some <coughs> of the demolition that is proposed. And again, this is the area in question. <coughs> And I apologize for the, the quality of this, but this is the same area highlighted and zoomed in on. Uh, so I will make sure that uh, Flagler is corrected for the record as well. It is uh, identified properly here in the legal description. Um, so I'll provide that correction to the clerk's office. Um, but exhibit A is the legal description, which is provided as a backup, uh, as well as exhibit B, which is the location map for this abandonment area. Uh, so some of the, the highlights of this item, uh, really the CRA has provided this request and Mr. Evans, uh, Mr. Scott Evans will have the ability to expand on this a little bit further in following slides. Um, however, we're really looking to do this in order to create a contiguous land area that will help really foster some economic development opportunities and hopefully promote future economic growth within this area. Uh, the current lot configuration is not really conducive uh, to allow that to happen. So we're hoping that this abandonment request can proceed. Um, this abandonment request is, is consistent with both the Marina District Master Plan as well as the Phase One Marina District Site Plan. Um, our Planning and Zoning Board did recommend approval of this abandonment uh, in September of last year. And first reading of Ordinance 4142 was approved by City Council on December 18th. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Scott Evans to uh, continue uh, following the staff recommendation slide. Um, we are recommending approval. We have one condition, uh, and that has to do with uh, recording an, an access easement over the same area that is proposed to be abandoned. Um, this is the same condition of approval that was provided on first reading. Uh, Mr. Evans? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gagney. Uh, good evening, Chair and City Council. Good evening. Um, following on first reading, there was some discussion um, related to this abandonment I just wanted to provide some background because there's a, a closely linked property exchange agreement that was approved by the CRA um, in September of 20, 2017. And the agreement uh, provides that following the abandonment of Old 13th Street that the, the CRA and Viking would exchange properties in order to create the larger development parcels that are needed to build out the future phases of the Marina Village. Um, and those can be seen on, on the screen above uh, in the two uh, blue this is um, Broadway to the left. Uh, this is the existing 13th Street and old 13th Street passes. And this area 
just south of, of the new 13th Street. So the property exchange agreement would create these largest type of parcels that are uh, that are, are well, uh, facilitate our ability to attract larger scale development. Um, following the abandonment, we would proceed directly with the real estate uh, exchange agreement, and we have a commitment from Viking to do that uh, immediately following this uh, abandonment. Those large scale developments will allow us to attract the future jobs, businesses, um, and enhance our tax revenue and attract the kind of economic development that we're, we're looking for in the marina. Uh, this is not a new concept. Um, in 2014, the site plan that was approved for the project uh, showed the larger, larger development parcels that we were planning for. And then additionally, um, the marina master plan that was approved also uh, created these large, large scale parcels that are required in order to build the type of development that we're looking to proceed with. Um, additionally, Viking and CRA have come to a tentative agreement, uh, which would allow us to acquire all of the properties um, adjacent to Broadway. So that would include both the property here that, that would belong to the CRA following the exchange agreement. We would own this property in blue that's adjacent to the marina. And then we, we would also tentatively, uh, pending CRA board approval and city council, uh, propose to purchase this property. So the abandonment ultimately would benefit the CRA and city entirely um, and would allow us to put together the entire block for future development, uh, which really positions the city and the CRA uh, to, to bring a really high quality development uh, to, the, to the city council for approval and to allow a lot of uh, new residential property um, parking garage um, and some new retail to go in this, this large area. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. All right, we'll go to public comment cards and then we'll come back to the board. Bessie Brown. We only have one? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. You should have left that up so I could ask a question about it. Um, good evening. Good evening. I'm Bessie Brown. And um, <clears throat> You abandoning the property? It, it, does, does the city own the property, or does um, Viking own the property? The abandonment, because he says it's going to make make it bigger. You know, then they, they, they're going to exchange properties and stuff. Who owns the property for, in the first place? <clears throat> I wish I could get an answer on this stuff. Then I can move on. But, uh, but I'd like to know who owned the property in the first place and, who, and who's going to benefit. And uh, you say, and, and because and then you said that you're talking about a, uh, a garage, a parking garage. And, 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 then when, and when are you all going to address this, the uh, payments that we are making to Viking for the, for the parking um, lot over there? for $11,000 a month. I really would like to know if we are still paying those $11,000 a month on, on, on that. Thank you. Madam <laughs> Chair, that concludes public comments on this item. All right. Um, Mr. Evans, did you have anything to add? Uh, and then we'll go on to the board. Certainly, if, uh, if we can put up the presentation that Mr. Evans had up there, I just wanted to um, explain something related to project and Mr. Evans if you can uh, come to the podium as well so the the process that is the board is considering this evening is to vacate the roadway um, the the roadway that is referred to as old 13th Street the new 13th Street is is the road that we all traverse as we enter um, the marina uh, to go to the event center and the marina uh, proper itself. Now, as it stands right now, uh, Mr. Evans, correct me if I'm wrong, that as part of vacating Old 13th Street, there is an agreement that is already in place that both parties have come to a conclusion and an agreement at an, an, an amount that is based on an appraisal that's provided by an appropriate entity that by the by vacating Old 13th, 
the city would then have the opportunity to acquire the parcel that is currently under the control of Viking that fronts the uh, Broadway corridor and then effectively assemble properties, what is referred to on the map as nine and 10. And the only property that would be outstanding that would assist in the development that we are contemplating with uh, the development team is what is where the number seven is with the old yachtsman property, correct? Yes, correct. And so uh, the, um, the Viking uh, Corporation that owns the property that fronts Broadway, they have agreed to sell the property to the city and the CRA for appraised value, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so this particular um, transaction vacates just the roadway, and by vacating the roadway, then it allows for other things that are critical to the city and the CRA having control of that entire block for the purposes of redevelopment. Um, in the event that we are in it, unsuccessful in doing that, it then causes some challenges for us as we look to work with the development community to spur economic development and growth in that particular area. I think one point that um, has been cleaned up from previous agreements is that the road to the south of the property which is referred to as 12th Street, if I'm not mistaken, will still remain open for ingress, egress, and access to the marina and other facilities. And so that roadway is not being vacated. In addition to, there is a little stretch of Old 13th Street that crosses Blue Heron that's adjacent to the um, uh, petroleum station. That particular uh, section is not contemplated in this vacation. It's only the stretch of Old 13th. So we're, the the spot that we have shown and Mr. Gagnon has shown as part of the presentation is the only part that we're talking about vacating for the purposes of allowing for us to move forward to have parcel assembly and then control over those two um, properties. Um, we anticipate if the board does move forward in a direction that they concur with staff recommendation and then move forward with this item on second and final reading that we can quickly bring something before the CRA and the city council to effectuate the land transaction to have the parcels under the control of the city and the CRA. Okay, um, questions or comments from the board? I had a couple of questions, Madam Chair. Go ahead. I'm happy to see that you guys have gotten a tentative agreement with Viking to be able to move forward. The other question is, what is the purchase price or what is the appraised price now? Um, we, the property that's located on um, Broadway, we have two appraisals, uh, one for 1.85 million and another one for 2.0 million. And so that's the value of the property. So we would be bringing something to the CRA board um, uh, for approximately 1.975, which would be underneath the, the appraised value. Um, the last meeting I had a couple of questions and I wanted to, to see a copy of the agreement which I just got yesterday. I also wanted the city attorney to look at it and uh, she has not had an opportunity herself to look at it because she just got it. So those were some of the questions that I had that, I mean, I got it yesterday. So I have not gotten a chance to look at it thoroughly like I want to to be able to prompt more questions. All right, anyone else? I guess the follow-up to that was, um, that Mr. Evans, I guess the request was done at the last meeting to get that paperwork over, and that was something that the council wanted to take a look at. Um, it was requested by Councilwoman Lanier, but we would have all you know, been interested in seeing this agreement prior to tonight's or yesterday's meeting. So if we can have those things promptly over, that'd be greatly appreciated. Yes. Anyone else? Madam Chair. Yes. So, a couple questions. Ms. Wynn, were you able to review those documents? I, have, I did a cursory review of it, but not in depth. Okay. Um, Mr. Evans, there's a portion of this abandonment that is dedicated for utility easements. Is it a way that you can perhaps depict it on there? Um, the entire roadway uh, would, would have an easement over it. Um, so the, the area that we're abandoning would become an easement 
um, and <coughs> until future development comes. It's anticipated that we would move any utilities that are located underneath that roadway uh, once we get approval to <coughs> construct new development on the site. And until then, that easement would remain in place to protect those, uh, those, <coughs> those existing facilities. Are you able to depict with a pointer or something like relatively where that easement is? Sure. And I have a question um, regarding that easement. So this is probably the best document to talk from. This is the uh, survey of the area and the abandonment area proposed is highlighted in, in the red box. Um, so as Mr. Evans stated, what the condition of approval actually is, is uh, we're asking that an easement's recorded over the same area that's being abandoned, which protects any existing easements, uh, excuse me, any existing utilities within the easement area um, until we can move forward with future redevelopment of that site. And when future redevelopment does occur, it'll probably be a replat. Um, you know, there'll probably be uh, an adjustment to existing utilities based on that future design and approval. And if I may, um, Councilman, I would contemplate that anyone that would look to develop that parcel will, as part of the development agreement, would have to relocate the utilities because obviously their pad for their building or, or infrastructure would be right there. So they would uh, probably look to relocate the utilities that may be buried underneath that roadway on the, uh, you know, on the periphery of the of the property as Thank part you. of the development. Thank you, Mr. Johnson Evans. That's exactly what I was trying to find out on the peripheral of the of the property line. Yeah. So what I don't understand, we're talking about this. Uh, I guess if you're looking at it, it's the furthermost portion of this box along the right. But it's ironic that currently FPL is replacing light poles on Broadway right now to concrete poles. And we've already got it in our CRA plan and budget to bury the utilities. And it just seems like to me this is something that we should have already done because if we're going to go and try to bury utilities at this point, it's going to be probably triple that amount now that we have concrete um, poles going up on Broadway. And if that's the easement that we're speaking of right along Broadway, at least on the frontage of Broadway, it kind of seems like um, it doesn't make sense to, you know, none of it makes sense that we're now allowing FPL. Well, we're not allowing FPL. They already have that right to replace those poles. But if we're going to go back and do what, I mean, we're going to go and probably a year or less and replace and take those same utilities and put them on the ground after they're doing them right now. Was there not any consideration of this plan? Yes, FP this was the work? FPL is aware that we, we're, we're still trying to proceed with the utility burial. Um, part of, they have like a statewide plan for facility upgrades that they're required to, to move forward with. And since our, the utility burial didn't happen on the original time frame, they are going to go ahead and, and move forward with their um, upgrades that they're re required to do, and they do that you know, statewide. That doesn't affect the cost. The cost for us to bury it is to um, dig a partial trench and then to al also do um, some uh, boring underneath the ground to, in order to bury the lines. The, the cost of, that FPL does for their upgrades um, doesn't really affect our our utility burial. Their facilities are as exists that they build under their, their statewide projects. So they can't change their projects. Our, our utility barrel didn't go forward as planned. Uh, so they went forward with their upgrades. But they're still well aware that we want to do the utility burial and they're continuing to work with us to try and make that happen as soon as possible. And, and, and Madam Chair, if I may, Councilman McCoy, I think uh, more importantly, I think what we need to do and you know, uh, Scott and, and Jeff certainly can opine on this, is that as a condition of the development and redevelopment of that site, that is something that I would pass the cost on to the developer to bury the utilities associated with the redevelopment of that, uh, that parcel and the parcels adjacent to it as a condition of the development agreement with the city. So I would pass that cost on as much as we can to the development community for the parcels that we have that are under our control. And I, and I don't know how you guys have seen that in other development agreements, but it's common in things I've seen uh, to 
allow for the private sector to incur the costs associated with that for the development of, of the site. It's just a condition of, of approval. Okay. Um, I don't think that's a bad idea, but truthfully, we pay the costs either way you look at it, but it just seems like we should have had our, I guess, our plan already in place to bear these utilities. That way, FPL, first of all, wouldn't tie up our two-lane northbound direction in doing this and you know it'd be much more simpler to take care of now but that's just an observation that i made um when traveling that area madam chair yes can the can the utility uh, relocations be wrapped into the uh, p3 financing uh, i've seen it in, in arrangements that I've been involved in that it's a condition of the development agreement between the local government entity to say that we have contemplated as part of our master plan of the area that you need to underground the utilities and it's a condition of the arrangement. So I think as it relates to um, as we move forward with discussions with the development entity that's interested in, in working with us here, uh, there's nothing that precludes us from stipulating that as a condition of the um, the agreement moving forward, at least in the area that is under the control and responsibility of the city. And then, obviously, as parcels redevelop, um, that can be, and I would have to get, you know, Scott and, and, and Jeff to provide some perspective, if can that be something that's stipulated as parcels look to redevelop in that Broadway corridor, can we effectively by modifying the code require that there's some type of you know date certain that you have to or any modifications to the existing structure beyond x number that they have to effectively underground the utility so it's not a cost that's completely borne by the government agency um i'll add well currently the cra has the uh, money in our capital budget to complete the utility burial uh, FPL needs a firm commitment in order to do that contract, so all the dollars have to be available. Um, but related to that, we could definitely identify the costs uh, per each property uh, and then look and then perhaps adopt some sort of ordinance, certainly for this property, which we control and we would be passing along to a developer, to calculate the cost of that burial on a property by property basis and then try and charge that to a future development uh, if we were able to achieve that. And for this particular property, uh, that would be very simple to do, and then we'd have to do some research and legal to see if we can carry those costs into the future and, and, and charge future developments. Because I certainly think if, if we're able to, as you know, just looking specifically at the parcels under our control, if we pass that cost on the developer, that's money that this board can utilize for other capital projects um, to effectuate some of the changes that you want to see within the, the CRA um, corridor and the, and the Broadway and Blue Heron corridor. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, so, but Mr. Evans, do you, Mr. Scott Evans, do you recall what that budgeted amount was? And am I correct that that has been budgeted for some years um, and it's been rolling over every year, correct? Y yes, that's correct. Uh, we have, I want to say we're, our current budget is approximately $2.9 million. And, um, that, and that's been carried over for a number of years, yes. And that starts, that I guess that, Location starts at the foot of the bridge and it goes all the way down to Civil Beach Road? It goes to 27th Street. So, so what's one has. block north of Blue Heron. And, but what we're talking about here is probably not even a third of the way down. Um, that's, it's more than halfway. <laughs> um, the first part of the utility burial, of course, happened during the phase one project of the Marina District. So we buried all of the utilities and all of the power lines in the marina area um, as a part of that project. So the next phase would be to do Broadway from 11th Street, which is right at the base of the bridge over the port, uh, all the way to 27th Street. Right. And that's the, that's, the, air, that's the, the area that we have the funding for currently. Right, but what I'm saying is our proposed phase two location is from 12, from Spanish courts north to I want to say maybe 14th or 15th Street. Uh, no, it's it's all the way north to 27th Street. No, no, the phase two. 
like the portion that we're going to charge to the developer potentially is only our, our phase two starts at oh yes Spanish courts and it ends at 14th Street am I correct uh, that's correct so um, again that's less than a third of of what you're proposing in that budget so um, I would just round the three million dollars so can we bring an item back at the CRA agenda to put one million from your capital back into a general fund no we need all of the dollars in order to get <laughs> FBI to move forward. but what we could do is in in negotiating the development agreement is try to recapture some of those dollars yeah. but FPL won't proceed if we don't have all the money in the I, bank and ready to go I got you I figured it was worth a try but I don't um you know that that that's also dependent upon whether or not that's something that the developer is amenable to doing so I just wanted to make sure that I was clear but you know I figured I'll throw that out there and also madam chair I think that the, the city needs to be a part of that development agreement so that in terms of negotiations the cost doesn't come back to us at some point well the city will be part of that negotiation yeah. but and this is the point that I was making um, so let's just say we say to the developer 1.3 million dollars we need you to bury the utilities from Spanish court down to 14th Street the cost still gets passed back on to us mr. Lanier I mean because it becomes a ground lease and we're gonna pay for it over the long run so even though the developers front the money you, you can be assured that the city is gonna pay for it how is that because that's a part of the ground that that's a part of the p3 that's the whole fundamental um basis of i the understand that but the thing about it is that if we are a part of this negotiation we can make sure that this cost does not come back to us we can do that so what's the incentive for the developer they got they got the project <laughs> right but it's only for a time certain and we would be making lease payments to help subsidize the financing for it the developer has gotten the project that's the, that's that's the first win for them secondly we cannot be uh, on the hook for all of these costs that are associated with different parts we understand that a p3 financing that we're going to have to put up some of the cost but we should not have to eat all of these costs okay madam chair yes um, mr evans as part of this agreement uh, mr scott evans the land that viking owns that actually is delaying the underground burial of the utilities is that a part of the agreement as well to have that that's <coughs> land vacated or are they transferring that to us what is going on with that i know we uh, mentioned that at the workshop uh, as a part of that agreement viking would uh, provide us the easements that are required in order to bury the utilities uh, in the broadway corridor okay so once this is completed, 13th Street's vacated, the agreement will be executed with land swap, and also they'll vacate uh, the easements for the underground railroad, underground railroad, Jesus. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the underground utilities. Just saw Harriet recently, I guess. <laughs> the underground utilities, and it would allow for us to <laughs> proceed forward with the actual burial of the utilities, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. All right, any other? Um comments questions I just want to make one quick comment before yes. we move forward mm -hmm. when I ask for stuff from staff and we have something before us I need to get the stuff before the day before was there a reason for the delay I uh, know I apologize for the delay the the vote overturned the original motion um, and then we didn't get enough the materials transmitted on time but I did so I apologize we'll get it to you earlier in the future all right hold you to that all right any other comments or questions? All right, Madam Clerk. Councilperson Lawson. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Councilperson McCoy. Yes. Pro Tem Botel. Yes. Chair Miller Anderson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Item number 10, regular item. Madam Chair, the time is now nine minutes to eight. Do you want to go to public comments? <clears throat> We yeah, we can. We can because it's short, so we can go ahead with public comments. Um, typically, I try to go a little bit longer since we just got started a few minutes ago. 
Um, but we'll go ahead. Public comment should be restricted to issues, matters, or topics pertinent to the city of Riviera Beach. Please be reminded that the city council has adopted rules of decorum governing public conduct during official meetings, which has been posted at the entrance of the council chambers. In an effort to preserve order, if any of the rules are not adhered to, the council chair may have any disruptive speaker or attendee removed from the podium, from the meeting, and or building if necessary. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Um, public comment will be for three minutes. Please make sure you pay attention to your time that's up there on the screen. And um, if you could kind of make your way close to the podium once she calls your name. She calls about three names so that you have a heads up. All right, Madam Clerk. Madam Chair, the acceptance of public comment cards for this particular section of the agenda is now closed. Bessie Brown, Cindy March, Fane Lozman. Yeah, she's coming. Ms. Brown, you coming up for your comment? Good evening, Bessie Brown. I um, I have a question as to why I haven't are we, when are we going to uh, appoint or hire a uh, chief of police? I thought everything was done last year, and you all were just going to make the choice, and nothing is on the agenda tonight about it. I'd like to know when is that going to happen. Also, um, we are hiring people. in the um, development in, 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 in Mr. Gagnon's uh, office and area with uh, just a uh, high school diploma and, and with the job and with the job and with a job salary of eighty one thousand dollars. I need to I really would like for to that, that to be cleared up. How in the world could that go on? And you had a um, building official, and, and this is a totally new position, and I don't even think that was actually advertised to be to be to be hired. We have we have people here that are still interim. Why are they still interim? You have people in public works that are still that are interim, and then you have. Um, Another another young man down there that was that, that was put, put moved down, you know. I think you, you really need to take a look at the people that are still not permanent, and do some um, do some job do some do some hiring practices and take care of all of the hiring practices. Now you've been back long enough to um, actually taking care of a bunch of that stuff, but then you but you but you change change some things in the budget, and then. Um, and then, then, but you still have not hired anyone. I think you know you need to you need to take care of those things that are, out, are open and outstanding from before you left, be, after you left, and now you're back. And I think um, <clears throat> you need to start funding these positions in these in these in these budget that uh, because we have money, we have money. The building official had left about nine or eleven million dollars here, so you so so we need to take care of this stuff. With, with the monies and dollars that we have instead of playing around with the budget. Thank you. Cindy March, Fane Lozman, Margaret Shepard. Good evening, Council. I'm Cindy March, and I Good just evening. want to elaborate on what she just got through speaking about. When is this position development service operation manager came available? And I know I was at a meeting before. Some of you all wasn't on the council at the time. I believe it was Don Prado and Lynn Hubbard and them was on the council trying to debate and weigh out what you got to have in order to get a position here as an employer. And it was told that you have to have a master's degree or you and you plus got to have so many years experience, but you must have that master's degree in place. The reason why I'm asking this hypothetical question, because on December 3rd, 
um, Deirdre hired someone, or Evans, Mr. Evans hired someone making $81,336.26 to be a Zach salary. That's more money than the bill official made. She went to jail, making less money, said she didn't have her credentials. And you know what, Mr. Evans, I can look you dead in the eye because as a man and as a woman and as my niece, I wish you and Lady March could have sat down instead of bumping heads, instead of all of these personal vendettas that's coming through Botel, Deirdre, Kashama. I'm not throwing rocks and hiding my hands. I'm calling the spade a spade because it's personal with me and it's gonna stay personal with me. But I really wish, and I don't know you personally and don't care to know you like you don't care to know me. But I wish as a person, as smart as you look, I wish you all could have sat down and weigh out y'all means of differences because you all could have made this city what you want it to be. Because she was a smart young lady. She brought money here. She wasn't just a whistleblower. She was whistleblower for what was right and making sure that the big developers didn't come through here or the poor person didn't come through here and got something for nothing. And you all didn't like that. But I hope and I hope and pray that you all do the right thing and justification because it's in black and white. Deirdre, can you tell me if you can speak? I don't know if it's a gag order, the young lady that you all hired with a high school diploma. I'm, I have a high school diploma a year ahead of time. I went to school. I did more than 19 hours than she did. The only reason why I dropped out because I wanted to hang on Terman and Rosemary. You know what, and I'm glad I did because it taught me to treat people like somebody. It didn't let me forget where I come from because I got a six-figure job. You all got to do better with taxpayers' money. So if y'all found $81,000 for this young lady that only has a high school diploma, don't go try to clean it up now, okay? Y'all find some money to rectify and justify Lady March. I do want to thank you, and you all do have a great night. Thank you. Fane Lozman. Fane Lozman. Good evening. Uh, Two of you were present a year and a half ago when I won the case at the U.S. Supreme Court. Bedard had an executive session with you. He was confident he would win at the Federal Court of Appeals. He lost. The case came back to Judge Middlebrooks in December. Judge Middlebrooks laughed when Bedard said, oh, we should just win as a matter of law. He set it for a new trial in late April. Right now, my legal fees are 876000 The cities are probably $1.75 million. Each side will have another 400000 but when I win, which I will, you can get a load star, which you can get an enhancement of the fee. So I could end up with my lawyers well over $2 million. So before Botel and I had our fight, she recognized Bedard was no good. And here's an example of him pulling a fast one on you. Bovell Richards, Mr. Mayor, I went in his office one time to have him check on a permit application. And Gagnon went crazy. He thought I was just wandering around there and talking to him. So that's why he got passed over for the building official and went to CAP. They discriminated against this man because they figured they couldn't control him, so they hired an outside building official instead of the man, Bovell Richards, that's worked here for 15 years. That's disgraceful. That's your job to do something about that. You know, there's a, a, a number of people went to a meeting when Lady March was here where Gagnon said he was going to, to punish me. He was because for my, my activism in the city, and that ultimately came about on the council uh, where you started adopting these rules to take away my development rights. So I said, I'm going to take a good look at some of you. It's known for years Mr. McCoy doesn't live in Revere Beach. I said, let's find out if that is true. We have here infrared photographs of Mr. McCoy's vehicle going back to 2018. Uh, I'm going to give this the election, uh, Department of Elections, where he has slept. And it was inconsistent when they went to check it, but he slept at 1081 Benoit Farms on at least 16 occasions. Uh, since 2018. He's also gone to 220 North 72nd Avenue in Hollywood, Florida on numerous occasions. He also pays the water, electrical, and garbage for 4903 Spruce Avenue, of which he sends that to his mother's house. He does not live at his mother's house. When he filled out his application to be an elected official, he said he lived in Riviera Beach. We have conclusive evidence in an extensive investigation. He does not live at his mother's house, and he hasn't lived there for quite a long time. Um, you know, when you, raise, when you take an oath of office, you have to have integrity. And these infrared photographs that were taken at all hours 
of late night and morning show that he doesn't sleep at his mother's house. There's no photographs of him ever being at his mother's house during the sleeping hours. So he doesn't sleep at his mother's house. He uses that as just a, a drop box, as a mailbox, and that does not qualify for residency. So Mr. McCoy, you're not gonna be able to get past this extensive surveillance of you and your Nissan Altima, and this will be turned over to the appropriate uh, agencies and they can deal with it. Thank you. Margaret Shepard, Amon Israel, Otoya Perry. Could you please step out with the phone, please? Margaret Shepard, Riviera Beach. The Honorable Mayor, to all of you in your respectable places. It, this is the most saddest thing that I continuously hear. We're talking about the children and the toys and seniors and whatever, and we continue to come here to bash women. My father was married to my mother 60 years, and I never heard my dad talk down to my mother. No respect, none. And absolutely women, I'm talking about women, that stand here with this ignorancy. I, I just never seen anything like it. I thought that it was going to get better. It has absolutely gotten worse. And it seemed like it's this click. It's just the public know. They say, Dr. Motel, you are one of the nicest people that they have ever met. And Kashama, I said it the other day, I just wish you had one more year as chair, one more year. I know the time is winding up, but we absolutely have absolutely done nothing because people laughing at you. Laughing at the ones that get here with this foolishness. And I want to say to you, Mr. Larson, that was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I, 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 I've been to many events, but I think that takes the cake. So let me be clear, Mr. Mayor, you're doing a fabulous job. You're leading this. I saw you on television. This is the first time I've ever seen a mayor from, from this city ever come before the commissioners. And I think that if we don't stop the foolishness, but Dr. Motel, just continuously take care of the children. I'm very upset again, Mr. Evans, about the Southside Coalition, the Brooks Center for those children. They had to go to the bathroom. They sitting out there in, in the little foyer that can't even go to the bathroom. I'm, I'm, I'm truly devastated that we do all of this, and yet, we have one person we're crucifying, one person we're crucifying, and we really think it's funny. Let me be clear on one thing. I think it's very ignorant. You look very stupid. And I tell you, it is time for the foolishness to stop. It's all about the business of the city. West Palm Beach is moving. Beautiful down here, and you come down here, and the only thing you got is your event center. And you're going, wah, wah, oh, this is great. How is it great? Thank you. Thank you. Amon Israel, Madam Chair, Ms. Perry stated that she did not want to speak. Okay. J.B. Dixon, Dolores Williams. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Chair, Council. Hotel. You all right? Wonderful, wonderful. There's a group of people going around <clears throat> telling our citizens that I, Amon Yisrael, and Jonathan Evans, our city manager, has fallen out. This group has the nerve to tell our citizens this, that we have fallen out. This is a great perversion of the truth. I have a great idea who these heathen are. They are those that love confusion and deception. If it wasn't for confusion and deception, they wouldn't have anything to do. They love to undermine anything. It's really time for good people to come together. When good people come together, we will do good things. 
Remember, Riviera Beach, when someone comes to you and tell you that story that Amon and Jonathan Evan has fallen out, you're listening to a Luciferian mind. Thank you. Thank you. J.B. Dixon, Dolores Williams. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Ms. Dixon oh, has passing. stated that she's passing. Dolores Williams, Sean Davis, John Miller. Good evening to the board and to the citizen here and to all the citizens that will be watching the television. I want to ask some questions. And I hope I could get some answers. One was, why did they have to have uh, something to try to bring our chief in? I thought, I think we have, not thought. I think we have a great interim chief already. And I think he has the experience. And I support him hold holiday, Chief Rozier. And I want to ask a question. I know sometimes when some of you get upset, you jump right in answer instead of leaving it to the manager afterwards, like you always say, wait till afterwards. I want to know, I want you to explain this to me. I know someone was trying to explain to me about the east side and the west side that the government give you funds to improve one side of the city. Is that, is that true, Mayor? I mean, a manager? I want you to ask me that. If that's if that the case, how long has it been set up that it's been placed on the east side? And how long will that be finished? You'll be over here improving that you can jump over the tracks to the west side. Because okay. I went to the CR, and I asked the lady about two years, and I, I spoke to her, and she said, no, you never talked to me. I said, yes, I did. I even got a secretary to remember that. I gave her number, and she said she's going to call me. And then I was saying, she said, well, what did you want me to do? That's how she talked to me. I said, I was just only asking to get my house painted. She said, well, I always call people back when I said, well, I'm sorry. You didn't talk, to, you didn't call me back. Then the next, you know, the next thing she asked me, well, what side of Australia are you on? I said, I'm on the west side. She said, well, we can't help you from the CRA. I want y'all to explain to me how that goes. Because if the people in the city of Revere Beach, please listen at that and stand up for the west side. If we not get what we, we're supposed to get from the government, you set it up on the east side. You see where they're doing all the improvement on the east side? We want some done on the west side. I couldn't even get my house done painted because I'm on the different side for the CR. It can't help me. How long is that going to be going on? And then I never got an answer about the man that paid. Did y'all ever sell that the man in the insurance? thing about the people with the money and insurance and the man that didn't pay the water bill for six months, now I have to pay a hundred and something. I want to know, can I get some of that money y'all got from them to take care of my water bill? Okay. Please check on that east side and that west side. I want to know. And then you say you was going to build this Revere Beach coal here. You didn't want no houses on the, your corridor. But yet you're gonna do some on Levin Street, and then you're gonna build these right up here on Broadway. How y'all gonna do one section? Don't do another section. Thank you. John Miller. That's the last one. Yes, Madam Chair. Right. John Miller. Good evening. Twelfth Nine D Manor Drive. Uh, I live on the east side, so I'm a little confused. I, I'm not sure what what we're talking about there, east side, west side. But there's nobody painting any houses on, uh, unless we pay for it, on the east side. Uh, other than that, look, I want to thank all of you up there, sitting up there, because I know what you did for so many children, so many people that are hurting around Christmas. You know, I keep hearing uh, Julie gets attacked, Kasham gets, every one of you do a lot of things. And you do it not because you're council people. You do it because of the, what's in your heart. And isn't that a great thing? And as far as you guys getting hammered all the time, um, I've been retired seven and a half years, and I've watched the same person do the same thing to I can't even count how many council people. There were some of them back in the day where they would argue back. That wouldn't get anywhere either. 
But know this, we support you and we're behind you. And you know, we're not, I'm not the person, I can't stand there and watch somebody being attacked when I know that you're doing everything you can to do it, what is right. So I'm not going to, because I have freedom of speech. I'm not up here, I'm not up here to uh, do anything but tell you that you have our support, keep doing what you're doing, and don't worry about these threats because the threats have been going on for years. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that completes public comments. Okay. Item number 10, regular agenda item. Resolution number 1-20, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, approving and adopting the 2020 revised Palm Beach County Local Mitigation, mitigation Strategy Plan, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Madam Chair, we do not have any public comment cards on this item. The acceptance of public comment cards on this item is now closed. All right. So moved. Second. Mr. Manager. Madam Chair and members of the council, if I can have Assistant City Manager Ms. Jacobs present this item. All right. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Honorable Mayor, Chairperson Miller I'm Anderson. I'm sorry. I did forget. Um, when we finish this, please answer the questions for public comments of what you had. Okay. okay. Um, other council persons in your respective places and City Manager Evans. For the record, my name is Deirdre Jacobs and I'm the Assistant City Manager here with the City of Riviera Beach. This particular item deals with a partnership that the city actually already is involved in with the county. It's just that particular, um, the legislation that was put in place five years ago has expired and it needs to be renewed. Um, the title of the item is the Lo Local Mitigation Strategy Program. And what it does is it allows us to partnership with the county and other municipalities in the county to be able to apply for funding from the federal <laughs> and state government for items that deal with um, natural disasters. It also allows us to be able to appoint staff persons to work along with the different municipalities to submit projects to be considered for, um, for funding opportunities. All right, any questions, comments from the board? I do, it's somewhat tangential to this issue, but I wondered if we as a city can take a look at measuring our capacity to bounce back after an episode such as a hurricane or some other natural disaster. I'd like to see if we can take that measure now and then work toward becoming more resilient over time. So for example, if after a hurricane only three of our gas stations can pump gas and we had 10, that's only a 30% resiliency in terms of gas. Likewise, ATMs and other public services that we offer. How, do we, how can we measure that and how can we improve our ability to bounce back after a, a disaster? I think that's something that would behoove us, particularly because I think that business and industry would look at us more favorably if we can tout ourselves as a community that recognizes that we need to be able to be more resilient and has done something about it. So I would offer that as a, something that perhaps some of this funding might allow us to do. Um, Mrs. Botel, this funding is actually for um, construction activities, not necessarily for preparing any types of plans, but I believe as a part of our emergency preparedness plan, that's a part of the fire department, that redundancy is um, a major component with regards to what's a part of that plan. A follow up. Just to, I want to be sure that we're measuring it though. I mean, I, I understand that it's a part of it, but I'd like to see some metrics investigated and perhaps put in place so that we can say, okay, we know how many banks can give us cash after a hurricane and let's work with our banking community, for example, or let's work with our um, gas station community or other, other services that we anticipate might have uh, gone down during a, a disaster and how do we, how do we measure how many do not have the capacity to rebound quickly, and how do we help them improve? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, and, and probably what I would recommend is that we have Interim Fire Chief John Kurt provide a just a brief presentation on some things that we have started the conversation internally and are putting pen to paper to speak to some of the concerns that you have for us to be able to operate pre and post event um, and so we look forward to bringing a, a plan a comprehensive plan that looks at some of the things that you've articulated as some concerns and I will have uh, Chief Kurt provide a, a brief presentation at your next board meeting. 
All right, anyone else? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, Ms. Deidre, could you give us a list of projects that we've submitted for this sure. local mitigation strategy plan? To date, there are a total of four projects that the city has submitted um, to be considered for funding opportunities, and they're all a part of the utility special district. And this doesn't mean that other departments cannot participate. It's just that only the utility special district has submitted such projects. Um, submittal of projects are done twice a year, which would be in May and September of each year. So um, I'm sure other departments can begin to position themselves to go ahead and submit projects to be considered. Um, with, but with regards to the particular question, the lift station number 47, a generated project, improvement project has been submitted. The second one is improvements to the North Chemical Building. Um, the third is the water treatment plant generator project. And the fourth would be standby generator projects for additional lift station improvements. So far, we've um, requested a total or put in um, a total of $3.4 million, $3 million in order to um, <coughs> submit for projects in the event that monies become available. It's my understanding that in the next few months, HUD will be putting out a request for applications for a little over $600 million. And it is our intent to submit for those, um, to be considered for those particular dollars. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Jacobs. In addition to that, the submissions that we're putting together, are we gonna have a team or is this gonna be an individual from the city that's gonna represent the mitigation strategy plan with the county? With regards to the, mid, the, the committee, um, there's always one person in particular and then a backup person, and usually it's someone that has like an engineering um, background. The projects are generally public works or utility projects. And would you be able to send us out some examples of what other uh, surrounding local municipalities have obtained funding for in the past so that we can make sure we're submitting the right projects and make sure that we do get some of this funding that's coming down the pipeline? Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, the funding is competitive, so um, by us already having our projects in place, it helps us out with regards to being able to just actually not have to go back and develop the different applications, but because they're already in a, a position to be submitted, um, we'll be able to basically just push a button and submit the projects, but they are all competitive, so along with other municipalities, but the good thing is that because we are part of this particular program, um, the county will support us and submit that information along with our applications to the state, to the state as well as the federal um, entities that will be that will have the monies available for us to apply for. Yeah, my biggest concern is that we've just never received funding um, from this process, and I just don't want we to be, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Jacob. Yes, sir, from my understanding, we've never submitted any funding for these projects. Okay, um, how long have we sat on this committee? I believe the committee goes back at least, if not more than a decade, it's just that we haven't been as responsive as we could have been. And who's going to be overseeing this? Is this going to be directly over you as an assistant city manager, Mr. Evans? Who's going to be making sure that these projects are submitted in a timely fashion for May and September? Uh, this has been a project that has been managed um, exclusively through uh, Ms. Jacobs' office and the USD staff working with the consultant, Mr. Nigel Grace, and the grant writer as it relates to prioritizing the projects and communicating the, the needs of the projects through the committee. So that's something that is housed um, in the auspice and the responsibilities of the assistant city manager. Okay. Being that we're gonna be in um, Tallahassee for Palm Beach Day, I definitely wanna make this a topic of discussion and be prepared so that we can have some talking points because I think that the relationships we have to establish that we've been going around the, the country to establish them is how we can actually receive some of these funding. So uh, whoever's gonna be in charge of this committee and who's over gonna be overseeing it, let's just put together some additional programs outside of the utility district to give as many opportunities for our city to receive some funds. And Councilman, to speak to your point, uh, we're also gonna be providing the council with some speaking points and some information as it relates to the priority projects. Um, so our trip to Tallahassee is very fruitful and we're speaking off the same sheet of music. Perfect. Yeah. And we do believe that we're about to get close to a $2 million grant from the State Department of Economic Opportunity for some utility special district projects. 
Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. You're welcome. Thank you. I would think, Madam Chair, Go I ahead. would think also, too, in terms of other departments, I would think that shovel-ready projects would be projects that you would also submit, uh, you know, from other departments, things that are already ready to go. We don't have to do that much work with it. Yeah. I think it just really involves us getting together and just having a conversation with other departments to make them aware. I'm sure Public Works is already aware of this particular initiative, but even other departments like the fire departments, they could also put in projects to con be considered for funding as well. Mr. McCoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Manager Jacobs, you said uh, we're on tap to get $2 million, possibly from a grant from DEO. Yes, sir. For utilities. Yes, sir. It's, from, it's for some of our aerial rehab projects. Department of Economic Opportunity. Yes, sir, the state. They do utilities? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. All right, I just thought that was some DEP handles. Um, when you started your presentation, you said we're doing this because the legislation has expired. Now, the Local Mitigation Strategy Act is a federal legislation. What exactly are we renewing? Is this some interlocal agreement yes, between us e and the county? Yes, exactly, it is. So that is expired? Exactly. Okay, so when and when did it expire? And it expires when, this month. When was it, like, how, how long does it last? How Five long years. It, okay. All right, and anything else? Follow up, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, when will we be selecting a represent, representative for this actual board? This committee? We can do it as soon as tomorrow. And what's going to be the process of that? Just picking an engineer or somebody from the city? Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Anyone else? All right. Madam Clerk? Councilperson Lawson? Yes. Councilperson Lanier? Yes. Councilperson McCoy? Yes. Pro Tem Botel? Yes. Chair Miller Anderson? Yes. Unanimous vote. Discussion and deliberation, item number 11. Discussion to set process for audit services. Madam Chair, we do have public comment cards on this item. The acceptance of public comment cards on this item is now closed. All right. Uh, motion a second, right? Motion. Did we have a motion second? Madam Chair, this is, the, this is a discussion Oh, item. discussion. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, it, says, Mr. it says discussion and deliberation. I know, Mr. Evans. Uh, so we don't Madam Chair, before I get into that item, would you like to move, like for me to address citizen comments? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, with regards to the Yachtsman property that the city currently or the CRA currently leases for the purposes of providing um, additional parking to service the Marina Event Center as well as the Marina proper, uh, the city does or the, the CRA does pay a lease payment that was referenced of approximately uh, $11,000 annually. However, the city and the CRA are working towards effectively looking to acquire that parcel and um, bring that to the board and the council for uh, consideration. Uh, Mr. Evans and I are working through some of the nuances of the deal and would like to bring something for you all to consider hopefully in the next 35 to 45 days. As it relates to the selection of a police chief, um, originally we were hopeful to be able to communicate who our top two finalists would be for the position um, earlier in the week. Uh, we have postponed that because we're working through some other nuances and intricacies associated with the process. We have completed the process and now we would like to move forward with a comprehensive background check of two individuals that we would like to move forward in the process. Uh, we will be communicating that information <coughs> to the public as soon as we get the commitments from those individuals that they are willing to move forward in the next uh, step of the process. Also, one of the things that we're asking for from those individuals that um, once we agree to moving forward in that process that there is an assumption that they will effectively accept the position if offered. We didn't want to get to a point where we go through a comprehensive background check and then 
a candidate withdraws from the process or we notify the number two candidate that we're entering into exclusive negotiations with the number one candidate. So we're working through those nuances and as soon as we get to a comfortable point, we will then uh, communicate to the public uh, who the top two candidates are. They will go through a thorough background check that will include looking at media, social media, um, looking at their personnel files in their respective agencies, speaking to their, um, uh, their peers in law enforcement, and then bringing back a comprehensive <coughs> report to us. A third party entity will conduct that research. Upon receiving that uh, information, uh, once that information is received, we will meet with uh, executive staff as well as members of the law enforcement team and then ultimately make a decision as to who is the uh, best candidate to move <coughs> the agency forward. Uh, with respect to the development services manager position, that was a position that we discussed as part of the budget process for fiscal year uh, 2020. That position is basically the individual that assists in spearheading some of the uh, permit process here in the city. Uh, we were successful in recruiting a talented individual from the, uh, the county that has uh, well over uh, two decades worth of service in uh, various planning and zoning um, entities that uh, has a broad understanding and expertise in addition to uh, since that individual has been brought on board in the agency, I have not gotten one phone call um, concerning a permit or a permit process. And they've only been on board with the agency, I think, for a little over a month now. But um, they are a dynamic asset to the team and, and doing a great job. So I, I did want to, to speak to that. Um, as it relates to uh, monies that are being expended uh, throughout the city and east side versus west side, I guess the individual was speaking consistent, uh, consistently about the, the CRA boundaries. The CRA, the Community Redevelopment Agency, can only spend monies in a specific geographic area and they can focus on different things than we as the city can focus on. We do have monies in certain areas in the community that we do spend CDBG monies. Uh, that is a block grant that is received um, from the, uh, the, the state and ultimately, or the feds ultimately then to the county and then it's uh, provided to um, the city of Riviera Beach to do certain projects. And so we've utilized that money for a lot of roadway projects uh, throughout our community. So any monies that we do receive from federal agencies or other agencies, uh, we do invest it throughout the community wherever the, ne the need is. Um, and I think that concluded the citizen comments. Okay. Question, yes. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mr. Evans, did you say we spend $11,000 a year? A month. Oh, I, I thought I heard you say a year. I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I wish. Uh, yeah, it's it's $11,000 a, a month, about $100,000 a year. Perhaps you should go back and see if they'll take 11000 for the month. That comes up to about 930 bucks. <laughs> Um, the so frugal. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair, I'm ready for the. Yes, we're ready. Okay. Uh, this next item before you is to establish the process for audit services for uh, fiscal year 2020, but you'll be looking at fiscal year 2019, closing out those books, and then uh, moving forward into uh, an agreement that would take us through 2023. Uh, previously, an item was brought before the board to move forward with auditing services, and the board uh, chose to reject the agreement or the, the RFP and um, direct staff to move forward with uh, attempting to secure a one year agreement with uh, HCT, uh, Certified Public Accountants. There was a statute that was adopted, and it is Florida State Statutes. Um, 218, 391, and in that statute, it prescribes a process that is different than the normal process that government entities have utilized for the purposes of selecting professional auditing services. In the past, uh, most agencies would put out a request for proposals, staff would work on a committee, and then recommend who their number one ranked firm is and then ultimately the policymakers would make the decision and you would move forward with your auditing services. 
With the change in the statute, it basically has alleviated or removed those responsibilities and duties from staff and has asked that the governing body appoint one of its members from the board to serve in the chair capacity and then a committee of at least three individuals to serve as the committee that is responsible for establishing the factors for evaluations, working on the announcements, the request for proposals, evaluating those proposals, and then ultimately ranking the entities that would come forward. Uh, we looked at a possibility or, or researched an opportunity to see if we can enter into a one-year agreement, but per the statute, um, if there is no extension that is contemplated in the agreement, the previous agreement which had expired, um, there's no way for us to, to move forward with offering an extension. One of the things that staff believes that it is the cleanest and most efficient process for us to move forward is that this board directs staff to effectively establish an audit committee <laughs> that is comprised of residents or business owners that have um, some basic financial or uh, business acumen knowledge of uh, financing and then our staff would assist um, in ministerial roles so if the board chooses to select one of the board members which you have to do as serving in that capacity and then you know you can have a board of five you can have a board of three staff would assist in providing technical assistance to assist in writing the request for the proposal uh, making sure that it's publicized in the right spots, but all the decision and the discussion and the, um, the substantive work that is done associated with selecting who that firm is going to be that makes it to the council for consideration will be done by that committee. Um, staff will, like I said, only serve as an advisory role and as a ministerial role to ensure that you know, we get the proposal out, and we get the information back and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for us to move forward in this process to go ahead and seat the appropriate um, audit committee and so we can move forward expeditiously in securing an auditor to close out our fiscal year 2019 books and then move forward um, with uh, regular auditing schedule my concern is is that the more time that we let lag, um, having the ability to get on someone's schedule and us have the opportunity to give the auditor to go through the things they need to go through to look at our financing, the more time that goes by that we don't uh, move in this fashion uh, provides a, a problematic situation for us. Uh, in my conversations with legal, we believe that this is the clearest and cleanest way for us to move forward. Um, by establishing the committee, letting the committee work on creating the scope and the criteria with one of your members uh, as serving on in that capacity. Obviously, now that you're abrogating that authority to one of your members to serve on that committee, the meetings are public, and so meeting minutes are taken, et cetera. And then as the committee convenes, convenes does the ranking and then proffers who the number one and number two ranked firm or three, top three if we get that many, that will come back to you in a regular council meeting for um, authorization to proceed forward with contract negotiations. So staff is prepared and recommending that we move forward with directing the city manager to establish the audit committee and then bring forward um, uh, the appropriate information and documentation necessary to effectuate uh, what we're asking for and certainly uh, We've had some challenges even sitting folks for our surtax committee. So if the board has names of individuals that they would like to offer up either this evening or in a, a couple days, uh, certainly we'd like to bring that before you for um, ratification as quickly as possible to sit this committee so we can start working on the request for proposals so we can get it out on the street and get our auditor selected. What is the deadline um, that we need to meet in order for us to not have any issues? Uh, Mr. Sherman, if, if you can provide some insight with regards to when the audit needs to be submitted to uh, the state, and then of course, um, GFOA as well. 
Randy Sherman, the fine instructor. Good evening. Um, GFOA is March 31st. You can always get an extension, which would push that to April 30th. Um, that's probably not realistic at this point. Um, the bond documents require financial statements by the end of April. Um, they will accept unaudited statements, but that just doesn't show a, you know, that we've got things under control. But the state deadline is June 30th, so we have till the end of June. How long would the um, RFP stay out? Um, I, I would envision that we would try to have the RFP out for 30 days, whatever 30, the minimum is. 30 days is what we would typically do. So how close are we cutting it to the, you said the March 31st for the GFOA? Yeah, the, the um, March 31st is their deadline, but we can't ask for an extension of 30 days. Is it frowned upon to have an, ask for an extension? Uh, not with GFOA. They understand, you know, the things. Matter of fact, even on the budget document, we ask for an extension. Um, so that's not the issue. Again, I'm more concerned with the bond disclosures. Um, they do, again, accept interim, you know, unaudited statements, but that's really not good for us to do that. If we're to um, provide the names by the end of the week, for instance, what what is the timeline? What would that look like? You get the people, how, I mean, what? Conceivably, if we were to get names from the board, uh, we would look to bring that back at your first meeting in, uh, or your second meeting in January, which we're proposing to be the 21st. And then um, I would look to say that as soon as they are seated, that we would get them in probably a day or two later um, for the purposes of their first meeting and, and working through what a scope would be for uh, the RFP document and, and trying to get it as close to wrapped up within that week as possible, even if we have to convene two or three times to, uh, to get the document prepared. One of the things that we're also um, looking to do, and um, I, I did run this pass uh, legal and they did do some research that we can have technical advisors that assist um, that help facilitate that and so there's you know competent and capable professionals that are outside of our municipality that have the expertise in this that can assist with uh, providing some assistance and even uh, uh, technical advisors from the internal staff uh, even Miss Busby would be another good individual to be involved as the technical advisors for the audit Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did you say when the work of this committee will be finished? Um, it, the, the work of the committee will conclude at the end of them making their presentation or recommendation to this body as it relates to the audit committee so as far as the... Um, give me an the anticipated audit. potential date of... Um, if we look at, if we're able to get the committee seated and get the... I would hope that if we have our first meeting on the 22nd or 23rd and we can put something out by, you know, first week of February, maybe by, we can have a recommendation or something considered for your second meeting in March. Okay. I think yeah. that would be pretty aggressive. And then from there, what would be the timeline once that happens? I just don't. Um, the after we would, um, as part of the RFP, one of the things we would recommend is include uh, the basic shell of the contract that we would look to proffer, and you know, a couple of blanks to where we would fill in what the necessary elements are. So those that are proposing have a general idea of what the terms and conditions of the contract would be, so they can execute it, and then we can also put in the scope of that. Upon execution of the agreement, we would hope that, you know, we can have auditors on site within, you know, 72 hours or two or a week or something uh, to get folks in the door because uh, we are running close to, to our, our deadlines. Madam Chair. Well, one second. So if we don't go this route, what is our other option? Um, based on, you know, the the actions that the board took and, and the information that we've been able to extract from the, the statute and 
looking back at the process that we undertook as an agency. Uh, unfortunately, when the RFP was uh, rejected, um, the way in which it was rejected uh, didn't really preserve any additional options for us, and it provides for some ambiguity or some confusion with regards to our ability to move forward in another fashion. And so I think the safest and cleanest way for us to move forward would be to sit the audit committee and comply with the statute because the statute is now what's in place. And unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to go back to uh, the previous decision that was made and, and try to remedy that because there, there still leaves some chance for vulnerability as it relates to the other regulatory agencies that look at you know, our practices and did we comply with you know, what the statute is and what it calls for. Because when we originally had the conversation um, from the regulatory agency standpoint, um, they did say that since we started the process prior to the change in the statute, you know, they felt comfortable as it stands. But now that we have to, looks like we have to go through the, go back through the process, uh, we don't get credit for the time and effort and energy that went into the first phase of it. Okay, Mr. McCoy. Okay, so that's exactly what I wanted to kind of pick up on. Mr. Evans, I think we differ on the interpretations of how we got here. And if, I think I thought I sent it to you yesterday, but definitely when we had the meeting and conversation, you know, I said there was three different, I guess, definitions or perhaps opinions that came out of that motion. And I got the minutes in front of me. But when the clerk read the resolution and she went on to say to award audit services to S. Davis and Associates, I made a motion to reject. So just based on that, because Chairwoman Botel, who sat as chair at that time, created, I guess had some confusion, and I further clarified. But when I said reject, it would suggest that I was rejecting what was placed before us. Now, how that translate into us now rejecting out the whole entire process, I disagree. Even, I think, uh, uh, another council person suggested that the clerk repeats back the motion. Well, I think she repeated it back, but I don't believe that it was, in fact, exactly accurate or my intentions of laying out that problem. Now, because we actually started this process before the new law change, as far as I'm concerned, we would still be in this same RFP because I rejected the actual item that was presented before us and that was read off by the clerk. And if that's the case, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this item is still open. To provide further clarity for, for that, I ask you to provide me those documents. And I'm looking at the email exchange between Mr. Sherman and Don Wynn and COO at HCTCPA. And the question was asked, please explain why the city is referencing an RFP document that was rejected. Mr. Sherman says the RFP was not rejected. The council at its discretion and within its authority elected to not accept the recommendations of the interim procurement director. So he puts it out that we rejected the recommendation of the procurement director. Further, in this email, it says the council awarded the RFP to HCT for one term year. And I know I spoke to you yesterday about the different um, I guess interpretations of how this goes, but certainly we're after the July 1st and some new rules apply, but I think what it all comes down to is what the legislative intent of the body was. And, you know, when I made the motion, there was some concerns and a question was asked by, I believe, um, Chair um, Botel, whether or not we could do that. And looking at the minutes, there was an affirmative given as we can move forward with the one year contract. However, what we realize is that the current contract didn't provide for renewals or extensions, but as far as I'm concerned, the item is still 
open because we never rejected all of the proposals. But but as I, Councilman McCoy, to your point, and, and here it was motion to reject, and then you clarified a motion to reject the RFP and the valuations, and, and herein lies the challenge is we're trying to extract <coughs> out of the motion that passed, we're trying to extract legislative intent, and it's not clear where the appropriate motion that should have been uh, discussed was a motion to reject awarding to S. Davis and a motion to award the contract to HCT for the, for the term of a one-year contract because the based on how it looks and how it reads, it's, it's we're trying to decipher what effectively was rejected and there's still no clarity as to the whole thing that because if you read it on the on the page here as, as I just did it's it's a motion to reject the RFP and the valuation so that's the entire process and, and that and there there lies the ambiguity or the concern that staff has that in the event that we look to enter into a contract, we have a documentation and official action from the board that the legislative intent may have been to effectively award to the number two firm, but it wasn't, it wasn't memorialized and it wasn't what the motion that was the official action that the board took. And so if it was something that the council had uh, some issues and needed clarity from that's when we should have you know had the discussion with the clerk to say no 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 we need to make sure that it is a motion to reject staff's recommendation on who the number one ranked firm is and award contract to the number two ranked firm but as it stands right now and based on the research that we've done and everything that we've looked at um, I think it causes for some concern and some pause as it relates to us moving forward outside of the, the, the process or what the statute calls for now. And, well, and well, I was very clear. I guess what happened was Chairwoman Botel didn't understand or perhaps had never experienced the opportunity where someone chooses to reject a resolution that has been placed before us. So when I tried to offer further clarification, because if you look at that agenda backup from August 21st, it gave the valuations and it also gave the submittal response from S. Davis and Associates. So it, it seems to be how you interpret this, but I guess since I made the motion, I think the onus would be on what my legislative <coughs> intent was that was supported by the members of the board. And to that note, you know, I know we have some other procedural things that we have to take care of, but to that note, I, I respectfully disagree with your opinion, and I want to reserve, when the time is right, uh, a motion to, um, um, uh, I would like to reserve some time to make another motion. Madam Chair? Oh, yes. It, it would seem that your, your, objection, your objection now is moot given the point that the process is a different legislative process now. Well, that, well, well see, that's what, I'm, that's, that's what I'm trying to get the manager to understand. When I said motion to reject, it was in response to what was presented before us, not reject the entire proposal, not reject the entire RFP. So, for instance, if we get 10 people that respond, and staff gives up a recommendation of number one. That's why, and you know, this is why it's kind of tough and I lend with you when you say you need information. Well, I don't want to see who staff recommended. I want to see all of the recommendations that way because the ultimate decision rests with us. So what I said is I want to reject the uh, motion to reject. It's clearly, it was three words, motion to reject what Claudine and Anthony had just read into the record. Then we moved on and I got a copy of the transcript and I know I've been in conversations with the attorney and with the manager about this for some time. But it was my understanding that we was rejecting S. Davis and Associates. So, so it's your contention that the issue is still open? Well, because the RFP was initiated before the law changed in July 1. And 
you know, we would be hard pressed, if not impossible, to start a new process come July 1. I mean, we were already, this RFP was issued in February of 2018. I mean, yeah, February of 2019. So where are we? Are we are we looking to uh, go by the, the legislative uh, uh, what is prescribed now, or are we going to go back to your original contention? Is that we go back and just go through the 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 uh, the, the uh, proposals that were sent in at the time? Is that what you're saying? Go back to those proposals and pick something out of that? There was only two. But but Madam Chair, if I may, there's a I move to reject the submittals. So if the submittals were rejected, how can you conceivably re-evaluate the submittals when they were rejected? Well, we wouldn't be re-evaluating. <laughs> but at some point we asked for um, to go back with HCT and there was some back and forth going on regarding the contract, right? I mean, the proposal of the contract. So we've gotten away from that because what? Well, but, but Mr. Evans, right where you're saying that, clearly it's very difficult to articulate when you don't, I guess this is all a new process to everybody. But what I did say was, so let me be clear, my motion was to reject. Madam Chair, you says, mm. I said I move re to reject <laughs> the submission. what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to reject the submittal. So arguably, you know, I've made it clear twice in here that I wanted to reject what was presented before us. And I guess if you look at that, you know what? Uh, you know, it, it's very difficult. It, it's really very difficult because, first of all, I thought the five years was too long. That was one of the major reasons why. And not to mention that we had the computer hack and me getting the information was like very last minute. So I thought in order for us to be able to make a really informed decision, let's do the bare minimum of one year and then move forward. That's why I offered up you know, that opportunity, just because here's why. We've already had a working relationship and I figured it would be much easier to continue where we were at the one year point and then go back out. And I, in fact, according to what the following motion says, makes what Mr. Sherman and Mr. Evans are proposing now is moot because right after I said, let us establish a committee within 30 days. And we're back here to discuss it. But my, my concern is, and what I would submit to you is that the RFP, in my opinion, was never rejected in whole. Okay, so back to what I was asking, we, what, what you just mentioned was to do the one year. And the, if I, my memory serves me correctly, it was something in the, within the contract that, or the statute that did not allow that to happen? Or how did we get away from that? Okay, so what happened was that we went back to negotiate with Mr. Harvey, with HCT. And he proposed many changes to the contract. He did not accept the, the standard contract that was attached to the RFP. He uh, struck through the indemnification language, so I believe some of the insurance language, standard language that we would never agree not to have in our contract. And he and I went back and forth, and then the negotiations just fell apart. And so, so that's why we did not enter into that contract with him. If, if we're able to continue the one year based on as it currently stands, is that still an option? I don't believe it's still an option. Okay. Um, the procurement director canceled the RFP, so there is nothing upon which to base a new contract. The motion that Mr. McCoy just read that was... Um, approved three to two was a motion to reject the submittals. That would be both submittals, S. Davis and Associates and HCT. Mm -hmm. If you rejected them in that pass, there's nothing out there. I ad additionally, I had a conversation with the Inspector General's office today, and their position was that if we have time 
we need to move forward with, under the new statute, appoint the audit committee and move forward as the new statute states. And they, they um, gave and, that recommendation based on what? Because after, at some point, there was an individual who filed a complaint about this process to the inspector general. They issued a letter to that person stating, because they went back and they reviewed these minutes, and they issued a letter stating, because the city has rejected the proposals and pretty much thrown that process out, your complaint is moot, and we've closed our investigation. Okay. So they were, and I didn't realize it, but they were reviewing this process at that point in time. They didn't notify my office, and I don't believe they notified the manager's office that they were reviewing it, but they had received uh, a complaint about our process. Okay. Um, I just don't see how we have enough time, realistically, to get through this by these deadlines. I mean, nobody wants to ask for an but, extension. But, but you know what? I mean, I'm just talking about the option that is presented to us right now. That just doesn't look like that's something we could meet. Madam, yes. Madam Chair, uh -huh. well, typically we would start the field work in January. That would be the earliest mm -hmm. and try to get the audit out by the end of March. Mm -hmm. So effectively three months or less. So if we can start in April, three, we'll have our three month time period. And the, I guess the, the advantage that we will have is we will be waiting on nothing. We'll have all of our actuarial reports. We'll have the ECR audit. Everything will be in place. Um, legal letters and all those things will all be done. Um, so I think the time period will actually go quicker than the typical three months. Um, and again, when they're doing it under a normal circumstance, they're doing multiple audits at that point. Um, my guess would be is by the time April, May, and June rolls around, they have fewer audits to work on. Um, so again, I, I think the number of hours, again, on April to June time frame, I think we can clearly get that done. I think the, the April GFOA and those things, that's never going to happen. Um, but I think we can still hit the June if we get that RFP out, as the manager said, decision in January, get it issued in February, contract in March, and really do the field work. From so there. my other um, concern is that we only had two people, we only had two organizations that... Um, Responded to the RFP, just two uh, or three. Was it three? I think there was so a three. Yeah, three. One was non right, one was uh, not. Okay, so so okay. Yeah, we we have no choice at this point. We have to it, basically we have to fast track this and move forward. Uh, in order uh, to my concern though is hopefully we have enough people at this point to that will be willing to even um, respond to the RFP, considering you know what we've gone through and if they were the only two, three, well two, responsive, um, that means that we would hopefully look for them to do it again um, or at least others to, well, if we don't get an, anyone, what happens then? Can, can, can I take you back because it seems like you guys are leaving from the point that I'm trying to make. And Go ahead. If I can also make sure that I preserve an opportunity <laughs> to make a motion because if you go back to the agenda item from August 21st, 2019, I can tell you the documents that's on there, and I'll just read them to you. The resolution, the professional services contract, the letter of recommendation that came from the procurement director, and two things. The RFP that was submitted by SDA, which is uh, S. Davidson Associates, and the selection committee scores. So I don't know how you can interpret that when I say reject all submittals. I mean, I guess it's according to what's placed before us in the backup in the agenda item. But some kind of way, I guess that's not your understanding or your take. But, you know, it seems like the onus and responsibility would be on me since I'm the one that actually created the motion. And then not only did I say it once, I think I clarified it four times, but more specifically, I said it twice move to reject. So, I mean, if you guys want to take it from there to say, that means reject everybody. You know, I certainly disagree because that wasn't my intent. And let me tell you why. Members, I literally struggled to get this information because we had the computer outage. And then when I look back at the minutes, here's why I thought it was such a, a big deal. Something Mr. Sherman said about that 
and he used the words, you know, we're in a tight spot and it was an emergency that we, it had to be expedited. So I figured that because of that, it would be easy to go right with where we were and reject what was presented before us and go right with the current firm that we had. You know, scoring aside and submittals and uh, submittals and uh, tabulations aside and just go back with the firm that we had because of the existing relationship. And further, Mr. Evans, you know, I'm looking at the backup now, right, that we have in front of us for this item. <clears throat> it appears to indicate that in this statute, give me, give me one second because I think I just lost it, but The Florida Statute 218.391 is saying, well, I guess this statute doesn't even have it, but the provision that I was looking at, um, I just had it here. But 218.391 subsection 9 says this. Members, if I can have your attention, it says if the entity fails to select. Now, this is the new law that went into place. Subsection nine of that chapter says if the entity fails to select the auditor in, the re in accordance with the requirements of subsection three through six, the entity must again perform the audit selection process in accordance with this selection to select an auditor to conduct audits for subsequent fiscal years. So it certainly gives us the authority to exercise the audit selection process in subsequent years, but I think it was contemplated that you're passing something July 1 that goes into effect that we can't even, you know, possibly go through that process in such a short time frame when everyone's fiscal year for municipalities ends September 30th. So, that's it. Let, let's go to public comment, then we'll come back up, if, you, if that's okay with everybody. Tanya Davis, Rod Harvey, Sean Davis, and Dolores Williams. Good evening. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Start clock, please. and City Manager. My name is Tanya Davis. I'm a partner with S. Davis and Associates PA. The city led RFP number 974-19-2 for annual audit services on February 15, 2019. S. Davis and Associates PA responded timely to the RFP on March 15, 2019. We were in compliance with all of the RFP requirements and were ranked number one by the evaluation committee with a recommendation being brought to the commission for award. There was a market difference in the scoring of the bidders and a Scribner's error made during the tallying of the scores would not have made a difference to the final ranking. And I believe that difference was about 50 points. SDA has the knowledge and skill level and has performed municipal and other governmental entity audits for over 25 years. We are a good firm with a proven track record for providing quality work for our clients. We have never been the auditor of the city and therefore bring a fresh new perspective and independent eyes to the city. The evaluation committee was made up of city personnel and outside individuals as was done in the past. This was in full compliance with state statutes as has been confirmed by the state of Florida Auditor General's office. There was a change in the state statutes regarding the makeup of the municipal evaluation committee which you have alluded to, but that law was effective July 1st, 2019 and does not and should not impact the process or procedures for this RFP for audit services, including the makeup of your selection committee and the final ranking. The timetable. The RFP was issued February 15, 2019. Proposals were due March 15, 2019. The evaluation committee evaluated the written proposals on May 24, 2019. <coughs> Oral presentations by the responsive bidders um, were presented and final scoring and ranking was done by the committee based on both the written proposals and the oral presentations on June 3rd, 2019. The new Florida state statute 
was effective July 1st, 2019. All of the city's procedures regarding the RFP were completed prior to the effective date of the new law. We see no reason why staff's recommendation was not approved and why it can't be approved even today. Again, we bring a fresh set of eyes. There is transparency in the process and the city adhered to the state statutes. We urge you to have no further delay in engaging an auditor for timely submission of your audit to the state of Florida Auditor General. There's no reason not to award the contract to SDA because our understanding was that the RFP was and may still be open. We have been laying in wait, if you will, to start your audit. Time is of the essence. Thank you. Thank you. Rod Harvey, Sean Davis, Dolores Williams. Good afternoon, council Good members, evening. city manager, city attorney, city clerk. My name is Roderick Harvey, partner with HCT. I agree, as it has been said, that this is a very important matter uh, that comes before you. I will submit to you that HCT has the institutional knowledge, as we are your current auditors, uh, even to the point that we still have a slot in our audit schedule uh, February 24th that we can begin your audit. We never took the city and the subsequent CRA and things out of our audit schedule. And so we believe that HCT represents the best way forward. We ask for your consideration. As an aside, when we went through the backup, we noted, and I will give the manager credit, he stated verbally the law correctly but I believe that someone posted the 2018 law. And so if we can, through the manager, we have printed out the 19 law uh, for consideration if you would uh, take. We believe that our experience as a prime CPA firm, we audit more governments as a prime CPA firm than any other local firm here in the Tri-County <coughs> area. As a prime auditor, not a firm that only audits one city as a prime and acts as a subcontractor, as a prime auditor and as your auditor, and having the date of February 24th available to start your engagement, we ask you to reconsider and approve HCT. I also submit to you humbly that our pricing model proposed in the engagement was better than, uh, by $10,000, than our competitor. So we believe having our institutional knowledge, having a date ready to put boots on the ground, having a way to get it done, as we always have, that you should reconsider and approve HCT to move forward. In conclusion, I will say that we worked with legal counsel as best we could. There was only one round of negotiation, we offered our changes, and after that, there was no responses. So we would hope that the council's wish would be coordinated, move forward by staff, and again, we believe HCT provides the best way forward as a prime CPA firm to get your audit for 2019 and forward done. Again, thank you for your time and attention. And as so, we have, and we do, serve at your will. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Davis, Dolores Williams. Sean Davis. Good evening. Good evening. S. Davis and Associates. Um, you heard earlier uh, my partner who talked about the process. The process was followed. We didn't see a reason for rejection. But now that you have rejected those, I would ask that you look at the proposals, that you look at the information that was brought before you and make that recommendation. We bring a fresh perspective, fresh eyes to your audit. We have not been here before, and I think that's what the city and entities are looking for, looking for a fresh set of eyes and, and appearance in what you do. There's a new council here. You guys have not been here for 10 years, 15 years, you're looking at different transparency issues and openness. We ask that you consider S. Davis and Associates. Lastly, I believe that your audit over the last 10 years 
was brought in on time, March 31st, one time. There were 10 years, one year was it brought in on time. We have a track record and history of doing single audit, financial audits for municipalities, and getting that stuff done right. There are no blemishes on S. Davis and Associates throughout the state, throughout the federal, and throughout the local. You check the record, you will see that. We ask for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, Ms. Dolores Williams was the last card. However, she has left. Okay. So Thank that you. completes public comments. All right. Um, back to the board. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, could I make a motion uh, to commence the process as required by Florida statute? Which is, which I'm making a motion to commence this process as required by Florida statute. Well, I Can asked we? to reserve. You did, you did. So hold on one, Okay. hold on, because he did. But the question, this, the, what was handed out to us, the item number eight and nine, I don't, it's not in the 18, so can you all explain what's the difference and how does, how does this one play into it now? I think that would be, um, I'm talking Mr. about Sherman. when, when or Ms. Wynn? Yes, um, Florida Statute 219, that's the only one you should be looking at at this point. Well, um, what, what, hold on, Ms., hold on. Ms. Wynn, so first of all, 219 before, or 218? 218.391. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, but 2019. Okay. Okay. You'll see at the, st at the top it says 2019 mm -hmm. Florida statutes, right? Mm -hmm. But can I say something before yeah, what, she starts? Yes, what is it? So this is what the confusion is about. Ms. Wynn and Mr. Evans has already kind of suggested that we're at the 2019 point. I contend that this RFP, just like all three of the public comment speakers got up and said the RFP is still on the table and that is subject to the 2018 um, statute. So before she goes any further, I think we need to be clear on what we're doing. Are we operating as this RFP is still open? Or if that's not the case, then the 2019 statute in front of us would be in play. But My as far as I'm concerned, that's why I pointed out members by going to the minutes to say when it was read, I made a motion to reject. And both these firms came here and made an appeal about that same RFP. So that would, you know, lend to the fact that the 2018 law is in effect and the RFP is still open. But for, you know, for what's clear is I made a motion to reject the submittal that was read, the recommendation that was read by the clerk. So we need to establish where we're going before she decides which statute, okay. which year she should read. But, but Madam Chair, yes. the, the, the internal general, uh, Attorney General, Internal General, OIG, yeah. and the city attorney have opined that the RFP is closed. I have been informed by Mr. Little that the RFP was canceled. Yes. Right, but, but, but how, who, who authorizes the cancellation of the RFP? And, and if you go to that route, and I told you this, Ms. Wynn, our code dictates how an RFP is canceled, and clearly that wasn't followed in this, in, this, in this method. Am I right? What you informed me was that if Mr. Little canceled the RFP, that he didn't do it correctly because I believe he didn't notice the prior proposals or submitters. Well, clearly not. I'm not if, familiar with that. I mean, he's but, here. He can talk about what he did. But, but, but Ms. Wynn, who would, ha I mean, who has the authority to cancel the RFP? Is what I'm asking you. I believe he exercised his authority as the interim procurement director because the submittals were rejected. There was nothing upon, there was nothing to keep open. Right. So what I'm saying to you, Ms. Wynn, are you saying the, so you're, interpret you're interpreting what my motion was when you say submittals? I think, I think that the minutes speak for themselves. Okay. So not the fact that I said motion to reject two times and I've tried to further And then you clarified it and said motion to, I reject the submittals. Okay, but I'm speaking of the submittals that was a part of the backup. Did you look at the backup from the August 21st meeting? We were oh. provided with a tabulation score and the submittals from S. Davis and Associates. But he, herein lies, the, I guess the concern is that we have to provide 
so many points of clarity based on what Councilman McCoy's legislative intent is. And if we're looking at an RFP and we say submittals, plural, submittals, we as city staff, we don't provide submittals. We provide agenda backups or those. Types. The submittals are what we receive as a product of the firms submitting to an RFP or an RFQ. Um, there's no time that we have ever utilized that vernacular when we talk about attachments as part of agenda items. Um, so common terminology, especially in the procurement realm, a submittal is I have submitted a proposal or a quote for the provision of providing X service. And, and that's where I think there's some ambiguity in if we decide to say that we're going to reject staff's recommendation and the submittals were still in play, I think it puts us in a different situation. But by we, uh, saying I reject and I reject the submittals, that's the mechanisms that were, that was the documents that were provided by the firm because in no other case and no other cir circumstance have we ever referred to as agenda backups as submittals. Well, that, that's what was on the agenda backup, the submittal. And, you know, I think I've made it clear, so. All right. So, Ms. Wynn. You were asking me what the difference is between the 2018 and the 2019 mm -hmm. statute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and how, to, how to explain again how each one of, well, why one applies and one doesn't, or what changed? The 2019 statute applies now because you are not operating, there is nothing out there for you to award a contract on. There's no RFP because it's been canceled. When did it get canceled, Mr. Little? So was this before, was it canceled after the discussion to do the extension of the contract? Wasn't that the same night of that meeting? Yes, the, the, there, there was another motion that Mr. McCoy made to redirect to direct staff to organize the audit committee, move forward with a renewal under the old statute. The old statute said that you could have renewals. Um, and so he directed staff to move forward with the renewal so uh, why for one could, year and, why then, didn't that and come back and reissue the RFP within the 30 days. We started the process of entering into, I guess, negotiations with Mr. Harvey. He sent a contract in that had changes that he did not contest during the RFP process. He made no exceptions to, those, to that standard contract, and those were changes that I would not have brought to you for legal sufficiency. So at some point, did we go back and say it needs to be exactly as it was originally, or it would not happen? He did not. The negotiations just broke down. So, but it never came back to us for us to weigh in on it? Correct. I would never have signed a contract allowing or recommending that you waive uh, indemnification. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying when the, the, the negotiations broke down. The only thing I believe, Mr. Evans, you can help me out here. The only thing that came back was just additional discussion. Well, at one point it did come back, and I believe there was a motion by Mr. McCoy to remove to remove it from the agenda yes. or delete it from the agenda. Uh, and so we didn't have, and I believe it was under discussion and deliberation and we didn't have that discussion yes. because there was a motion to remove it. Okay, so, all right. So Mr. Little, when was it? Um, Good evening, Council. Ricky Little, Interim Procurement Deep Director. In. The RFP was canceled once we had the determination that the submittals would be rejected so at that point we go ahead and close the rfp at that point we don't need to leave it open at that point so it was probably canceled at the time in which you were going back and forth with negotiation this way uh it was probably a couple of weeks after that actual motion actually i can give you the exact date yeah. i don't have it in front of me well can i help you out yeah i'm looking at the cancellation notice that's posted on the website dated august 22nd 2019 it says City of Riviera Beach, RFP okay. number 974-19-2, annual audit services. To all proposals on the above project, please note contents herein affixed paste or staple to proposal document 
you have on hand. The following statement supersedes and supplant corresponding items in the above subject proposal as follows. <coughs> general, information, general information, cancel. RFP number 974-19-2, annual audit services until further notice. So I take that as we are at that further notice point right here. I mean, clearly that even this suggested that there was going to be an opportunity to revisit this. I mean, until further notice, if you cancel the RFP, you cancel it. Further notice suggests that it's going back to be revisited. And that's when you would reissue it. Correct. Right, but it wouldn't be the same RFP. If you cancel the RFP, it's canceled, period. Correct. Because we canceled, and, I, and, and I'm glad you made that, that point. Two reasons. I looked at two other cancelizations that we had. None of them reference further notice. And not only that, Ms. Wynn, under our Muni code, the cancellation of invitation of for bids or request for proposal clearly states an invitation for bids, request for proposal, or other solicitation may be canceled, or any and all bids or proposal may be rejected in whole or in part as may be specified in the solicitation when it is for good cause and in the best interest of the city, period. The reasons, therefore, shall be made a part of the contract file. Each solicitation issued by the city shall state the solicitation may be canceled and that the bid or proposal may be rejected in whole or in part for good cause when in the best interest of the city. Notice of cancellation shall be sent to all businesses solicited. The notice shall identify the solicitation, comma, explain the reasons for the cancellation and where appropriate, explain the opportunity, explain that an opportunity will be given to compete on any recent solicitation or any further procurement of the same or similar item. So here's two things that I noticed that wasn't, in my opinion, followed. It's apparent that these submitters came here today advocating for their uh, award of this contract that they didn't get the notice as provided for in our code. And there's no reason explaining what the cancellation was for on this notice. So, you know, I, again, I contend that- What I don't was the even, date of cancellation? It says August 22nd, 2019. The day after the council meeting. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Can I make a motion to cancel the uh, uh, RFP officially? Mr. Hold on. McCoy did mention earlier. I don't know if he's doing. Are you still I, entertaining that? Or? I am, but okay. I think because she was on the dissenting side, she'd be precluded from introducing any motion t mm -hmm. pertaining to this. No, that That's would, that would only apply at the very mm -hmm. next meeting. So um, we are. Yeah, you, my I mean, first of all, it's already been canceled. Wait. So that, there's no need for a motion to cancel. The cancellation has occurred. Even though we didn't follow our prescribed process in canceling it. Mr. Little's just informed me that he never notifies the um, proposers directly. He always posts it on the website, and that's where they get their notice, just like they get notice that a, a proposal is being let. Okay. What? Well, I mean, I, I, I differ from, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why we have codes and we can carve out what we want to use, but I think we've had this item enough. But it, I move that we suspend the rules related to um, reconsideration and that, that we uh, vote to reconsider RFP 974-19-2. We have a second. Do we have a second? The motion dies for lack of a second. Madam Chair. Chair. Ms. Uh, Botel and then Lawson. It seems to me that we've heard the recommendation from our legal counsel, we've heard the recommendation from our finance director, and we've heard the recommendation from our city manager that we comply with the now current code and I would think that we would want to move forward as, expedi as expeditiously as possible to create this committee. I already have someone on Singer Island who's agreed to participate. He's the former partner at Price Waterhouse and is very well adept at um, 
these matters, uh, and uh, I think that we should move forward in that direction. Mr. Lawson. Thank you, Madam Chair. On what date did the new statute take effect, Mr. Evans or Ms. Wynn? July 1, 2019. And at the meeting on August 21st, we directed staff to begin negotiations with our previous firm for a one-year contract. Correct. And at that time, negotiations began and broke down at what date? I don't remember the exact date. I would say two to three weeks after So I, I guess my question is, why is it that we cannot continue and complete negotiations as instructed by the council and voted on at that meeting? Continue negotiations with Mr. Harvey? Correct. Because again, we, I posed that question, Mr. McCoy was in my office today to the uh, Office of the Inspector General. Their position was that we should move forward pursuant to the current statute, to pursuant to the 2019 statute. They could not give us, uh, a, they don't issue advisory opinions. Mr. McCoy asked the question, as a matter of fact, and that was the response. Now, if we do it, I mean, if you want to do that and move forward with Mr. Harvey, we can do that. We will possibly, the state auditor general will come back and say that we should not have, and possibly the, the uh, office of the inspector general may come forward. That's a chance that you take but if you, you know that going in, it's your decision. Right, but Ms. Wynn, can you clarify that? Those questions were general in nature. She didn't know the nature of the motions that we had made. No, she knew the nature because I spoke to her prior to you speaking to her. Remember, I told you I spoke to her earlier that day okay. and I would be happy to call her back and we called her back. Madam Chair? Oh, hold on, Lawson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So to continue with that process, can you give details as to why the negotiations with Mr. Harvey broke down? Right. Um, I'll tell you the changes that we, the normal process is that when you issue an RFP, there's a contract, a standard contract attached to that. Mm -hmm. If a proposal, a proposer has a problem with that during the period that they submit, they tell you what those exceptions to the contract are. Mr. Little informed me that Mr. Harvey never took any exceptions to the contract. When I received the contract from Mr. Harvey, there was an additional, I believe, $66,000. Um, I believe Mr. Sherman told me that that had something to do with the CRA, but I'm not positive, and he can speak to that. Um, the, the contract termination clause normally says that we can terminate the contract with or without cause. He struck the without cause. Um, he wanted a 30-day cure period, which I really didn't have a problem with. He reduced the, the uh, professional liability insurance from $1 million to $500,000. He deleted the automobile liability insurance and all of the indemnification. I believe that may have been Oh, he did not want the contract to come back to council for approval because he stated that the resolution or the vote from the August 21st meeting should suffice. And as you know, we always bring contracts back to you. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Ms. Quinn, also, oh, isn't She's there a provision the in the statute with regards to the, um, the extension and the if it allows for an extension with an expired contractor? The 2000, at this point, we would have been under the 2018 contract, I mean, the 2018 statute. But I thought you said we were under 2019. No, at the point when we were negotiating with Mr. Harvey and we had let the proposal, the RFP out, we were under the 2018. Because we let the contract, we, we issued the RFP prior to the effective date the of July the 2019. 
But now, because you're saying that the RFP was canceled, now we're under the 2019. Yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's been my position all along. Um, there's, a, there's a provision in the 2018 statute, and I'm addressing it because Mr. Evans just asked me to, that says that written contracts entered into may be renewed. The renewals may be done without the, the use of the auditor selection process and the renewals have to be in writing. But the problem with that is that there were no renewals left under Mr. Harvey's contract. It was a five-year contract, no, no renewals. And doesn't our code require us after five years to go out for a competitive solicitation? Correct. We, we have not, to my knowledge, issued contracts longer than a five-year term, even if it's three years with a two-year renewal. So, Ms. Wynn. Madam Chair. Hold on, Ms. Salasa. Thank you. So, Ms. Wynn, in reference to the discussion of renewing the contract, being that negotiations broke down, there were changes from our previous contract. We could not do a one-year contract as directed by the council because essentially we, we couldn't come to an agreement with Mr. Harvey. And there were right. changes from the previous five-year contract that we had that wouldn't allow for us to agree upon that as a council. But that was never brought to before the board, though. Correct. Okay. Ms. Wynn, can I just say something? Hold um, on, hold on. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Mr. McCoy. So I wrote you an email on December 16th, and I say, and I, when I say wrote you an email to you and to the assistant attorney, can you please provide me with the statutory provision that you indicated last Tuesday that present, prevents the city from entering into a contract beyond the five years? The assistant city attorney copied you as well as your other staff members and responded and says, she responded and said that there was nothing. There was no, there was nothing in our code. It still remains that we had a five year contract with him with no renewals stated in that contract. Okay, you can't, but there's you can't nothing just... in our code, though. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, is it, was there anyone else? Madam Did Chair, you have something? Uh -huh. Yes, I would like to make a motion mm -hmm. to proceed with the audit process according to Florida statute as proposed by the city manager. Second. All right. Any comments? But... Here's the thing, we've already voted on that. And we voted on that, that was the same exact motion that, the second motion that we voted on on August 21st. And again, I, I, I resubmit to you, Ms. Wynn, like what would be the purpose? Now, if he came back here today with a convention on what that committee looks like or represents, then you know I'd be okay with that. But essentially, Councilperson Lanier is introducing the item that she was not on the prevailing side for because that's exactly what I brought up um, on August 21st. And if I have to go back, I'll read that motion exactly what I said. Madam Chair, can I be recognized for another motion? You indicated yes. I said, I move that we direct staff to reissue, well, first of all, I'm sorry, to organize an audit committee. And I ask that we move forward with the renewal as provided for under 218, that allows us to do a renewal or a, or a lease, that's not correct. I wanna say a one year contract and then come back and reissue the RFP in 30 days. And during that process, it was voted on with Councilperson Lanier dissenting. If I can reference you to page 64 through 64 through 68 of the minutes for that day. And I guess if you, since we're there, 65, you said, yeah, you could extend the contract. So clearly we, mm -hmm. we kind of gotten some information that wasn't consistent, but point certainly- Point of order, Madam Chair, point, on. point of order. We need to speak on the motion that's on the table here. Right, but I'm making a point of parliamentary inquiry that you're not allowed to make a motion because you weren't on the prevailing side. This is hold a whole on, new hold motion on. here. If you withdraw your motion, I'll make it. All right, I withdraw my motion. Madam Chair. Yes. 
I move that the council authorize the creation of an audit services committee that council directs the city manager to establish an application for consideration by the council for appointment to the committee consistent with the items contained in this resolution and that the resolution shall take effect upon its passage and approval by city council. Do we have a second? Second. All right, will we have any comments regarding this motion? Madam Chair? Go ahead. Will we be voting on the council member to sit on this committee? And how quickly would we like to establish this committee? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to bring that at your next meeting. Um, we're going to go ahead and request the names if, if council uh, members can provide us names. And, and we do have a standard applications, but um, it's my recommendation that the, the council make a determination as to how many folks they do want to select and then if any of the council members at the meeting on the 21st choose to self-nominate and then the the board effectively appoint them to serve as the chair on that committee we do all that on the 21st madam chair hold on Ms. Lassa. yes madam chair and then the committee is consistent based on the statue of one council member and three individuals you can go three five seven whichever it has to be a committee of at least three at least three including the council member including the council person who will serve as the chair of that committee Okay, and then recommendations will come from the board um, based on the applications that you've provided or just recommendations that we bring to the table? Um, recommendations from the, um, the audit committee would be responsible for working with staff to create the scope and the criteria, interviewing the, uh, the entities that do propose, and then offering a recommendation to the council. So they would... We as staff would introduce the item, but the chair ultimately would probably end up making the presentation to the board for consideration. Okay, colleagues, I'd recommend that we just incorporate that into our motion to expedite this process so that we can decide on if we're going to do three, five, or seven members uh, to this board so we can get this process going. Ms. Dr. Voltel, does you want to add? So be specific, please, about what you'd like to add to the motion. If we can do five members. Uh, I'll, I'll, amend, one I'll amend member. the motion to to specify five members. That hold on. That includes the one council member. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So everyone won't get a um, choice unless that person who's not going to be on who the council person that's going on there. So that would be your choice. Yeah. It's only sector people get a choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. So did you, did you get that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, does your motion, st your second stand? Yes. And, and Madam Chair, can we restate the motion just to ensure that there's there's clarity on what the board does? You, did on? you write it down? I couldn't get it all down. The I, I really read it. The, the council authorizes the creation of an audit services committee <clears throat> to be comprised of five members, including a council person. The council directs the city manager to establish an application for consideration by the council for appointment of the committee consistent with the items contained in the resolution, and the resolution shall take effect upon its passage and approval by the city council. It's all in here. I'll send it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, any other comments? All right, Madam Clerk. Council person Lawson. Yes. Council person Lanier. Yes. Council person McCoy. Yes. Hotel Botel. Yes. Chair Miller-Anderson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Item number 12. And um, you all might want to watch the time unless you're planning on extending. Um, I, I think I can, I can get this item done okay. um, very quickly. Uh, Madam uh, Chair, yes. Mr. Evans, my apologies. We do have two public comment cards on this item. The acceptance of public comment cards on this item is now closed. Oh, you're talking about number 12? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I, I was going to say it now. We I still think I can, I can uh, get this done. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the council, the item before you uh, this evening is consistent with the direction and the discussion that we had at the Saturday, December 14th workshop concerning the possibility of planning, organizing a polo event on the municipal beach here in the city of Riviera Beach uh, on Singer Island. Um, in our past experience concerning this event, it was um, well advertised and it provided a unique event that the city of Riviera Beach looks to be a contributing sponsor and looks to um, bring events to our community that other municipalities cannot necessarily provide as we look to be a hub for um, things unique to Palm Beach County and continue to 
um, add to our, our tourism uh, uh, process or our tourism desires. Uh, one of the things that is critical to the success of any type of major special event, obviously, is um, contributions and bringing monies to the table. And so one of the, what we're asking as it relates to this agenda item is to authorize the city manager and staff to work with a, an entity about the possibility of being, bringing an equestrian event or a polo event on the beach here in the city of Riviera Beach and that we would look to pool some uh, resources that we have not to exceed $20,000 to be a co-sponsor or a presenting sponsor as it relates to the event and then work out some reciprocal arrangement where the city can look to recoup some of the monies as it relates to gate receipts or advertising and promotion, those types of things. One of the things we would also look to do, and this is going at, at some of the large scale events that we would like to do in the future, is looking to assist in providing in-kind um, public safety services. One of the biggest deters, deterrents for um, event organizers is the cost for law enforcement and fire safety. Um, and so we're looking at the opportunity that in subsequent discussions with the board that we look to co-sponsor events and, and effectively that's our contribution to the event uh, because we do already budget for those funds it's not going to be a windfall in profits to the city if we get five or six thousand dollars associated with this plus um, when you do have these events that other individuals or entities put on it's less of a burden on city staff that has a lot of events that we're managing ourselves so um, we want to explore the possibility of moving forward with this we know that there's a short window as we have turtle nesting season that's quickly approaching so staff is requesting direction for us to move forward with attempting to solidify an arrangement and obviously all the nuances associated with an agreement and the uh, sponsorship proposals and all that that will end up coming back before you in contracts and agreements at subsequent uh, meetings but we do want to get the blessings from the council to move forward and staff is prepared to uh, provide any insight or perspective associated with this and, and dr. Botel as well obviously being involved in the uh, event last year all right go to public comment gonna we'll come back up here Fane Lozman JB Dixon Fane Lozman. Good evening. Good evening. I just, uh, before I make my comments, I just have a point of order to make that the section 2 27 of the code ordinances is quite clear in section, um, in section, section A. The city council person or mayor should move out of the city limits during a term in office. Mr. They Lozman's shall automatically forfeit the office. Polo. I, no, I understand that, but I'm saying he should not be participating in any debates or discussion before this board with the irrefutable evidence that he does not reside, he does not sleep in the city, and that's the definition of residence. So you, I put you guys on notice, both the photographic evidence the and polo, the polo, Mr. Lozman. Polo. The human resources that this man should not be participating in any city business the code of ordinances says he has to forfeit his office. You have a responsibility when you raise your right hand to uphold the charter. That's, he made that decision not to reside in the city, not to sleep in the city. But having his mail sent to his mom's house is not residence. And that's a lot of time, a lot of money went in to prepare this report. You know, so I mean, you should, you have responsibility to uphold the charter, all four of you, and you're shirking your responsibility, you know, which is shameful. Uh, I was told that if you want to have the beach polo event, it's too late in 2020 to do it. Meaning that by the time the event would be held, it would be internal nesting season and the event should be held in January or February. So a 2020 event, uh, it's too late to schedule a 2020 event. You'd have to go to 2021 and hold it at the beginning of the year before the turtle season uh, started. Thank you. J.B. Dixon. <clears throat> J.B. Dixon, um, 3000 North Ocean Drive. 
Singer Island in Riviera Beach. First of all, since the previous speaker again went off subject to address Councilman McCoy's residency, I would like to weigh in on that also. Um, the purported proof of lack of residency has not been submitted to anybody that I know of other than waved around <laughs> at this podium. Therefore, I do not feel that the council should take any position on that accusation, much less prevent Councilman uh, McCoy from voting, because it cannot possibly be official <laughs> until you have seen this purported evidence. Secondly, as in terms of the polo event itself, um, the determination of whether or not one event can be given this year will be determined in the action that the city manager is requesting. That is to enter into negotiations and one of those negotiations would be the date. And it is possible, A, to have it before turtle season or after turtle season, perhaps even in the fall as opposed, which is still 2020. <laughs> 2020 is not limited to the season as it is known of you know January, February, March. So it might take place in April, might take place in May, might take place in October. So I would like to respond to that by saying that that is also something that one needn't be concerned about at this point. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board. Madam Chair. Go ahead. I believe the dates for turtle nesting season are May 1st to October 31st, so I'm sure that we can work out the event and get it around that. So that's not gonna be an issue for us to get it done this year. Second to that, I do have a few questions. How will we establish partnership with the entity that's actually gonna be hosting the event? What is gonna be the process of procuring this entity that's gonna host it and co-host it with us? Um, we, we have an entity that, that is certainly interested that has done large scale events and premier events in the South Florida area. Our intention is to, to sit down and have discussions with them and uh, determine what's the most optimal relationship. Uh, should we feel comfortable with uh, what the entity is looking to um, bring forward, uh, we will then look to memorialize that as part of a, an agreement that will come before you all um, and also would be subject to internal conversations or one-on-one -on -one conversations with the board to uh, bring you up to speed in advance of you seeing it for the first time on the dais. Um, certainly one of the things that we do want to leverage is the opportunity for uh, promoting our community, um, working with the, uh, the hotels on the island and the hotels in our community as well as the, the, the restaurants and vendors, making sure that they benefit from said arrangement and then the leveraging of sponsorship dollars uh, to offset the uh, the cost as much as possible and then the opportunity to say that we want exclusivity that you know uh, if we're going to do this event we don't want you doing this event anywhere else in palm beach county or contiguous county for that matter so you can do it in miami you can't do it in um, broward or, or and you can do it here in palm beach in riviera beach so we would look to want to form a relationship that's long-standing because I think once we create that brand and we are a, a premier destination for such an event, um, there's opportunities to grow and see it expand after, after a couple. So we would work through the, the nuances and intricacies and develop sponsorship packages and, and work to make sure that we get a, a bite of the apple and we're involved in the decision-making process. Perfect, and I would also like uh, Mr. Evans for us to be able to have access, if we're gonna partner, to have access to all the books and to just have it a uh, transparent process so that we can really partner with them in regards to sponsorship dollars, in regards to gate dollars, vendor fees, so we can make it a true process, um, similar to what they've done in Miami. And I actually promised Dr. Botel some information I'm gonna try to get over to her from Miami Gardens event. Um, the dates, I would actually also like the council to consider using, looking at dates in um, April for it because we've had discussions about possibly bringing a Jazz on the Beach event. So this would be perfect to have this event, the Polos event in April, and then having Jazz on the Beach in like November yeah. so that we don't uh, coincide with our nesting season and we can have events at the beginning and end of the year. Yeah. Those are my comments, Manager. All right, anyone else? 
All right. Um, just one yes. thing. I just think that we need to, and I totally agree with moving forward with this. I think that we need to have a formal process, you know, some type of policy in place that even for unsolicited proposals that we will be able to see and see if that's something we want to go forward with. But having something as a city policy in terms of how this works, permitting and this kind of thing, so that everybody's on the same page with uh, bringing those ideas to the table. And, and, I, and I certainly agree, uh, Councilman Lanier. What we would like to do is bring forward a, um, a community co-sponsored event list. So we may have 10 events that we say that these are large scale community events that we partner up with X entities and then you as an elected body say, these are the events that we provide some type of concession and in return we're a premier sponsor or those types of things. And so that calendar is set, we know that. And if anyone does want to consider being a co-sponsor, there's an application process that's reviewed and then is considered and, and that's how we uh, move forward, but you're you're absolutely right and it's something that's on the radar for us. Yeah, because I don't want people to start, you know, just coming to the podium and then, you know, putting us in that position. <laughs> so, <laughs> Chair? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that City Council authorize the City Manager to enter into negotiations with parties, uh, respective parties, to effectuate the actions necessary to conduct a professional polo event to be held on the municipal beach in Revere Beach. I have a second? Second. All right, Madam Clerk. Councilperson Lawson. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Councilperson McCoy. Yes. Pro Tem Botel. Yes. Chair Miller Anderson. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right. Um, no board appointments. Discussion by City Manager. Um, Madam Chair, uh, just to, to recap the uh, conversation concerning the discussions that we had earlier today about uh, the PBA uh, contract staff is going to. Uh, present the information that was provided by the council today, uh, tomorrow at the one o'clock meeting. Um, in the event that we see that there is uh, additional traction to effectively get us to a point where we can uh, solidify an agreement, um, I will personally call each and every one of you and, and, and let you know. Uh, but again, thank you for your leadership and the direction that you provided us. And I think we're we're a lot closer to uh, to getting this resolved because we all value the contribution that our law enforcement team uh, has uh, contributed to our city and in, in helping to make our community safe. So um, we will keep you attuned to that, and I appreciate uh, your support in the direction that we'd like to move the agency. All right, thank you. Uh, discussion by city attorney. No comments. All right, city council committee reports. Um, Mr. Lawson, did, did you go to the TBA? Did you give that update? I give yeah. Because the there's something meeting. in the paper today, tonight. There was something in the paper today. Yeah. So did you? I was. I gave the update at the last meeting in reference to about the role. Yeah. yeah about the okay. Role. Okay. Yes. But there is something in the paper this evening you might want to take a look at. Um, statements by the mayor and city council. We'll start with Mayor Felder. Yes, first of all, I'd like to say Happy New Year to our residents, to our council. Um, just a couple of things. As we, we're moving forward um, with our 2020, um, there are some issues that, on the table that uh, some residents have been calling my office about. And I hope we can um, pretty fast give an update on the Monroe Heights project um, and just s some of the stuff I had talked to Mr. Evans about, um, speed bumps, um, what are we going to do with the um, the streets? Um, so as we are moving forward, I just hope that uh, we don't forget about them. And also, uh, let's look at having some events uh, on the east side. Not it's not an east or a west side, but I mean on the west side. It's not an east or a west. But some of the residents, older residents, was asking me could we do more events at the Dan Callaway Park and stuff like that. So I asked them, um, I'm kind of doing a survey and getting. Uh, some ideas of what they would like to see over there. So I hope we can also um, sit down and help support something um, on that end. So that's it for me. Madam Chair, if yes. I may uh, comment on the mayor's remarks, uh, consistent with the comments that Councilman uh, McCoy has made, we are going to be bringing an item on the 21st of uh, January that is going to speak uh, specifically to the um, Monroe Heights issues and, and creating a pathway forward for us to engage the community and then 
move forward with taking some corrective actions that the community would like to see. So that's uh, going to be something that's going to happen this month. Is the H Avenue, the um, bike lane in tied in with that, or has that not been, no, just the Monroe Heights one right Yeah, there? just just the Monroe Heights at this particular moment. All yes. right. Councilwoman Chair Pro Tem Botel. Uh, just um, I'm hoping still to have the quarterly Singer Island Town Hall meeting on Thursday, uh, January 16th at 6 o'clock at the Ambassador Center on Singer Island, uh, unless something untoward happens uh, at home. Um, then also, uh, just to remind you that at the end of the parade on the 18th, come on over to Singer Island because we will be having our fabulous uh, food and art festival f to benefit Susan G. Coleman. So once you're done parading, come on over and spend some time listening to good music and good food on the island. Thank you. All right, Mr. Evans, you need to say something right quick. Um, we wanted to, uh, and I did send out a, a calendar request or, or doodle poll to get uh, comments from the board concerning the state of the city address. And it looks like there's two dates that um, the council is, is looking at um, whether it is, I believe, February 8th or March 14th. Um, you sent the poll out? Yeah. Um, it, it would be my recommendation if the board would uh, uh, indulge staff to do it on March 14th because I think it, you know, um, it goes well with the spring cleaning theme and, and some of the things that we're looking to uh, move the city. It gives us enough opportunity to advertise and promote <laughs> and to get a good crowd um, there. Uh, the, the state of the city would probably, light hors d'oeuvres and refreshments will be from six to seven, and then we would kick off at, at seven. Uh, the venue would be the Suncoast uh, High School Auditorium, and we are uh, looking to uh, introduce a lot of things to the community and, and inform them on some of the, the projects and initiatives that we have going forward. In addition to, I think we would also have some information on some of the grant uh, opportunities that are uh, on the horizon. And uh, we're working on some things that are pretty exciting concerning our library that I'd like to inform the board on. But, you know, I don't want to jinx myself as it relates to, to that. So um, um, we'll, the we'll 14th is I don't know how many people would go, but I know a lot of people from here go to Jazz in the Gardens. That's that weekend at 14th and 15th. Um, uh, oh, can we get a motion to extend for so about 10 minutes? Second. Second. Okay. Councilperson Lawson? Yes. Councilperson Lanier? Yes. Councilperson McCoy? Yes. Pro Tem Hotel? Yeah. Yes. Chair Miller Anderson? Yes. So, you know, I know a lot of people from here do go there, so I don't know how that's that, on Friday. That's, that's on Saturday, Saturday Sunday. Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we wanted to look maybe the 13th. Well, that's Friday the that's 13th. It. I don't know if I. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know. How about the following? Um, the following Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, because oh, yeah. I think legislative session is done, and then we may have some something yeah. really to bring home. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. I don't point? have my calendar with me. The twenty first. Yeah, twenty first. Yeah. Jeeps on the beach. Okay. That's All right. Yeah. All right. Um, you were finished, right, Botel? Yes. Um, Mr. McCoy. I have nothing. All right, Miss Lanier. Um, Pull your mic down. I just like to thank the city manager. <laughs> the employees of the city of Riviera Beach for all your hard work. I really appreciate the fact that um, a lot of times I don't get the stuff that I need in time, but but I know we're getting better. And I understand the fact that it is a lot of work that you guys are doing. So I really appreciate your efforts. I really appreciate you providing us the information that you do get to us. And uh, Happy New Year to all the residents. Mr. Lawson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Evans. I have an email um, dated for the Lone Pine Estates community concerns I uh, sent over to you and Ms. Deidre. I only got one response, and um, there's another meeting coming up. If you could follow up with that from November 12th so I can give them an update. Uh, Mr. Blankenship's the only one that responded to that one. Okay. The um, <clears throat> second one, there was an email dated December 18th. I wanted to just kind of go over some of those requests so that we could get an update. We talked about the disparity study, and we did a presentation with a B2G, a demo. If you could give me an update on what's going on with that and the status of the disparity study and the demo that we did with B2G. If I could get an emailed response for the 
3501 Broadway project that we sent out and then possibly send out a list of capital improvements to the council over the next five years. And then what's going to be our method for utilizing um, the procurement of those projects. Just responding to those emails for me. Okay, no problem. And then the surtax committee. I know we had a deadline December 6th, and with the applications, are we taking names for the surtax committee? Uh, yes, we do need some additional um, folks for the surtax committee. We've only gotten three applicants for that, so um, we're looking probably for an additional, at minimum, two, uh, but hopefully if we can get another three to four would be, would be excellent. Okay, if I could put on a record, if we could, doc, uh, do you need the individual to apply or can I just make a nom uh, nomination for someone? as part of because that's going to be an item that I'm going to be bringing before the board to appoint the individuals but also as part of the agenda item I will allow for the board to add in um, some other folks to serve on that committee so do you want to email notice of uh, yeah an item? okay yeah. I'll send that over to you and also if you could give me an update on the parking status of parking model that we put into the budget to see when we can get that established for our beach and the marina area Okay, no problem. And last but not least, do we have a policy for Revere Beach employees um, where they have the ability to serve as mentors uh, during work hours? I know we spoke about it, but if we could discuss that. Yes, and, and we do. We do have a policy that Okay, if I can get a copy of that policy, um, because I do want to implement a process for our schools to have some of our employees volunteer over there. And I think those are the requests I had for Mr. Evans. Oh, last thing. I know we talked about possibly just telling our story. And I know my counsel, my colleagues believe I'm just doing too much right now. I'm no, doing no, a lot. Don't. So of course not. I, I want to really make sure that we're telling our story to the residents in the community. So whatever opportunity that we have to have media, to have our our new digital team, I know we I just hired Ms. AJ Water uh, Walker and Walter to have at every event that we have throughout the city, whether it's provided by the council, Parks and Rec, or any event, I'd love to have some representation there so it can get out to the residents, to the media, so they can know about what's going on. Um, I actually wanted to also announce we have another event coming up, which is gonna be on January 20th. That's gonna be the Monday. We had a discussion here where we had a mental health forum, and one of the speakers said that a lot of people come to these events, but they're not actually getting to the people. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it out to the park that day. We're going to have a cookout in the park. We're going to have a cook-off with a lot of local vendors. Um, McCray's Barbecue, Sherwin Foster, Daniel Edge will come out there to barbecue for free for the residents. And we're going to do free haircuts. And we're going to have a mental health discussion panel for all of our residents. So uh, January 20th will be that date. So if we can go ahead and make sure that all the resident staff and we can discuss that. I wanted to actually meet with you, Mr. Evans, about that event as well. That's MLK weekend. That's MLK Day. Day, right? I'm sorry, MLK, MLK Day. Day. Yes. So it's gonna be a barbecue in the park. So it's just gonna be more so for the residents to come out, get free food, free haircuts, fellowship, and we're gonna talk about mental health in the minority community. And I believe that's it, Madam Chair, thank you. All right, Mr. McCoy, you had something else? No, I'm done, Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Evans, where are we with the forensic audit? Have we um, taken a look at that? One of the, the things that a after, I think all the council members have, um, received information from the Office of the Inspector General concerning the audit um, that is being conducted on the health insurance. Um, and the question that we had is that the intention behind the forensic audit would be to look at those elements that were contained in that. Um, we have not moved forward with that because we wanted to get direction from the board if that, based on your conversations with the Inspector General, if you wanted to move forward with a forensic audit on that specific aspect, or is there a desire to look at other elements in the organization? Yeah, that? I mean, when I, for the past couple of years, been bringing this up, it seems like uh, for a while, almost three years now, it was, it, we didn't have the insurance issue at that point, so it was to look in various departments. So I, you know, I don't want to hold it up for the insurance, and especially after we had the meeting, I don't see how that's going to really um, play yeah. into it anyway. Okay. So. Question. Yes. Well, you know, looking at 218-391, that statute doesn't limit the auditor selection yeah. committee to just that, but that is a that's function of the auditor. Hope, we're, see, this is what happens when I let you all go first. That's right, that's right. Um, 
So, you know, it might be a good idea if we want to keep that committee to kind of define a more uh, refined scope of what that forensic audit should look like. Right, right. Um, yeah, we have to, yeah, because, it, we do. We do have to be very specific as to because, what we want. Because, you know, I was, look, I think those numbers came in at $800,000 for Yes, it's pretty year. expensive. Yeah, we have to really drill down on what and, and condense it. So that's a topic that we would have to put on but, the um, agenda to discuss what we want to do. Right. I think in the... In, but when reading that statute, mm -hmm. the statute says they aren't limited to just being the auditor selection committee for the st citywide audit. So that may be something that we could explore. Well, I don't know and, if we want the them doing that. The, the other thing that, you know, we're, we're conscientious as part of a internal audit process and how do you involve that committee as to the selection process of the internal audit and then they have a staff liaison that they work with because the audit remains confidential until it is complete mm -hmm. um, so we can certainly um, we, we have tentatively um, come to terms with an employee for the internal auditor um, has a vast experience in, in audit, uh, multiple uh, government agencies. CPA also has the ability to do uh, technology audits um, and, and those types of things. And so um, I certainly uh, will uh, make it a point to uh, jot down some, some notes and then we can have it as a discussion and deliberation items to get direction from the board as what are some of the things that you would like for us to look at as it relates to um, operations uh, okay. to, to jump in and do a, a forensic, an in-depth forensic audit. Okay. And I know we have about one minute left. The I did send those emails regarding the home on this, on that, regarding, what was it, the, um, the home that I think is operating without a license for the uh, mental health. Yes. But I know you sent a, a memo out. Was that in regards to that? That... That was in regards to the discussion that we're going to have the, with the board on on Saturday, holistically looking at sober homes and uh, people that are um, conducting uh, mental health or, or uh, facilities that service um, folks that are of protected classes, and and that in in lies the biggest challenges that we have as a city is because the state has effectively preempted us in our ability to regulate um, these homes in addition to um, they are protected classes. And so what happens is, and, and Mr. Gagnon is working on an element of this presentation to show that um, anytime a local government tries to enforce additional laws and rules, then they would have council, their council respond back as well, you have to provide us a reasonable accommodation but the last, the, and I'm going to cut it off because I know it's time to go, but they were supposed to be going before the magistrate. So is that on hold now because of the, the it, memo that was sent out? If, they are, if they're going before the magistrate, that process is still okay. going on. Okay, yeah. so you can just, just update me on that yeah. with the email, and then the other one was about the code enforcement memo that came. I didn't know if that was in response to the email that I sent about the other that, that's in response to the discussion that we're going to be having with the board the oh two okay members. they just yeah. came right after yeah, i sent those came, two yeah. emails so i didn't know and i didn't get an answer so yeah. i thought that was the answer yeah, those those are part of your packet that you will receive tomorrow with all the other uh, supporting documents concerning what we will be discussing okay so just project. check on those emails and I give will. me an answer with that we are adjourned.